I call the meeting of the Environment and Natural Resources Finance and Policy Committee to order. A quorum is present. Representative Liz Lagarde, have you looked at the minutes? So moved, Mr. Chair. Representative Liz Lagarde moves the minutes for March 7th, 2023. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. Motion prevails, the minutes are adopted. Uh, members and audience, we have a very full agenda today. So we're going to try to move promptly. Um, I'm going to mention the time allotted that we have for uh, the bills. So Representative Kozlowski is first with House File 1873, and we have till about 20 after 3 for this bill. Welcome uh, to the committee. I will move that House File 1873 be recommended to be re-referred to the Judiciary Finance and Policy Committee. Representative Kozlowski, welcome. Excellent. Thank you, Chair uh, Hanson and members of the committee. We are here and grateful for the opportunity to present House File 1873. Um, as we know, our clean water is a very valuable resource here in Minnesota, um, and the access and connection to it is very vital. Um, I live right on the lake in, in uh, Duluth, and access to streams and rivers and, and everything else. Um, so we know that it's also really important to our identity, our culture, tradition, but also to our economy and to our recreational access and drinking and supply. So um, we're here for this bill as environmental degradation and climate change continue to um, face us with, you know, 100 year storms and droughts uh, turned into every 10 years that threaten our future. And here, even in the land of 10,000 lakes, there is a finite amount of water with very real threats to our water supply made up of, you know, aquifers and lakes, streams, wetlands and more. Um, so. Here with that commitment to advance our climate resilient solutions that will equip us and uh, our friends in the DNR agency with more responsive tools and investments for um, folks to protect and restore the health of our water and our soil and our land and our people. And so that's why this bill is really important is because compliance and education are the goal with the state's water laws and DNR permits are necessary to protect um, and ensure the best use of Minnesota wa Minnesota's water resources and DNR permits are also the best available information to provide for equity and fairness among water users and project proponents. So to provide for the protection of water quantity, quality and ecological benefits in non-compliance with these water laws or permit conditions also threaten the sustainability of water resources that Minnesotans depend on. So DNR's existing enforcement authorities are insufficient to address serious or repeat violations of state water laws and changes to the existing authorities through this legislation would help d the DNR to ensure our water supply is sustainable and protect public water resources as well as to address the non-compliance using a vi variety of compliance tools. And the intent before you with this proposed policy change is to ensure the DNR has those tools necessary um, to protect Minnesota water resources for future generations to come. So um, the last point is much of the language before you today actually mirrors the MPCA's authorities. And next I'd like to turn it over to my testifier, Katie Smith, who is here from the DNR um, as the Ecological and Water Resources Division Director to run through the bill. Um, before we do that, Representative Kozlowski, I believe you have an A1 author's amendment. Is that correct? That is correct, Chair. Uh, I will move the A1 amendment to get the bill in the form the author would like. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The motion prevails and the A1 amendment is adopted. Uh, Director Smith to the bill as amended. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Katie Smith, Director of the Ecological and Water Resources Division at Minnesota DNR. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Um, as Representative Kozlowski shared, um, the DNR does play an important role in ensuring sustainable water use through its regulatory permit programs. Um, compliance with the state's water laws and permit programs is necessary to protect our natural resources and ensure the best use of our waters. Um, it provides for equity and fairness among users, applies the best available data to inform our decisions, and provides protection not only for quantity but water quality and ecological benefits. Um, Noncompliance with water laws, particularly in times of drought, can really threaten the sustainability. DNR's existing enforcement authorities are insufficient to address serious or repeat violations of state water laws. And so changes to our existing limited authorities would help DNR to ensure our water supply is protected and hold violators accountable using a variety of compliance tools. 
The DNR has the authority to issue administrative penalty orders or APOs with monetary penalties up to $20,000 for appropriating water without the necessary permit. However, those penalty amounts are specifically dictated in statute. The $20,000 limit is too low to deter violators and the penalties must be forgiven if the violations are corrected. This proposal would give DNR greater discretion for calculating penalties, increase the APO cap to $40,000, and require penalties to be paid for those violations that are serious or repeat. Now the APO is a tool that can, that can be used for a limited penalty amount, and it can only be used for situations where corrective actions can be completed within 30 days. So other compliance tools, such as those used by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, would give DNR new authority to enter into schedules of compliance, stipulations, agreements, and other actions to compel performance. These tools can be applied to a variety of situations, those that don't warrant a penalty, those needing prolonged corrective action timelines in order to reach resolution, those that would benefit from negotiations with a permittee, and those so egregious that they would warrant higher penalties. This proposal would give DNR the authority to investigate, require tests and information to be provided, and then use the appropriate tool to achieve compliance with water appropriation laws, work in public waters, and other laws governing waters of the state. The DNR also proposes that duty of candor language is enacted, prohibiting parties from knowingly providing false information or failing to provide information the person knows is necessary for the DNR to make decisions to administer these water permit programs and laws. For the most serious violations, such as those that may harm or have harmed natural resources, repeated violations, or where economic benefit was gained, DNR is seeking authority to assess civil penalties of up to $10,000 per day of violation. These penalties would be assessed through tools such as a stipulation agreement that are not limited by a maximum penalty amount and provide for a negotiated settlement with the violator. The bill also allows for willful or negligent violations of these water programs to be referred by DNR to law enforcement agencies for investigation. We think these would be rare occurrences. So the DNR feels these enhancements of authorities and tools would help ensure our water resources are protected and available for future generations of Minnesotans. Um, we are aware of concerns by stakeholders and, and permittees such as the Irrigators Association and we're committed to continue to work cooperatively to try to address those concerns. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today and glad to stand for questions. Thank you. Next, Anna Brazier, Prairie Farm Company. Welcome, and if you could state your name for the record. Uh, Mr. Chair, Doug Carnival for the record, representing the uh, Irrigators Association of Minnesota with Anna Brage, who's <laughs> here as the, uh, the uh, Vice President of the Association here in Minnesota. She's going to provide some personal testimony as a family farmer here, but I just wanted to point out that we've been working with the PCA to try and limit this bill. It, uh, it seems to provide for a remedy in situations that really aren't applicable to family farms that may overuse permitted water during emergencies like droughts. Um, and the bill has stricken language that has a graduated penalty approach and simply said up to $40,000. That gives these folks a great concern as well as the in, in, in insertion into the bill of the opportunity for criminal penalties without any indication as to how uh, that might be applied. So we have some reservations and I think Anna can tell you her personal story. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and before we do that, I would like to have the author at the table when uh, there's testimony. Sure. I'll, so. I'll, I'll excuse myself. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for having me. My name is Anna Brazy. Um, I own and operate um, my family farm in Rice, Minnesota. I'm in Benton County. I returned to the farm in 2018 after for 15 years of working in the metro area. Uh, my dad bought the farm from his family um, and established irrigation in our area and we are currently a fourth generation farm. We have prioritized sustainable agriculture and conservation of natural resources as well as our community for many years. We are recently certified Minnesota agricultural water quality producers um, and we use best management practices to grow food like potatoes, kidney beans, peas and corn. Um, I also serve as a vice president of the Irrigators Association, which advocates and educates um, irrigators across our state. 
you know, Minnesota is an ag state. Um, agricultural production and processing ranks second in the overall GDP, uh, $112 billion annually in economic impact and 430,000 jobs. Irrigation uh, applies to about 750,000 of those acres um, and help farmers grow crops including um, the top 10 that Minnesota produces, corn, sugar beets, peas, soybeans, potatoes, canola, wheat, alfalfa, and horticulture. Um, we've, we've had water allocations for a long time. We've been reporting water use. Um, we got our first irrigator in 1970, so almost 50 years. Um, and um, across our state, very few infractions are caused by farmers. I think this bill um, disproportionately affects farmers um, who are trying to produce crops and sustain their business and, and are doing so, you know, as economically and with conservation in mind as possible. So using a one-size-fits-all approach um, on enforcement doesn't really work here and we think there should be some exemptions for agriculture. Uh, the main concerns again are the increased fines. I have 70 pivots on my farm so I know that I can't go over on my water permits 40,000 times 70 that would be more than my farm could handle for sure. Um, and um, civil penalties and potential criminal prosecution is also something that I think is unintended for, for agriculture. Um, and I think that's the end of my comments and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any question? Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify for or against the bill? Anyone else? Any questions uh, from members? Representative Gilman. Thank you, Chair. Um, this question is for the author. Mm -hmm. So, um, why does this bill um, require actions um, to have? Um, the bill venued in Ramsey County District Court. Um, so usually, if there's an action that happens, um, it would be the, where it would be where the harm occurs instead of coming down to Ramsey County. Representative Kozlowski. Chair Hansen and uh, Representative Gilman. I think that's a question best answered uh, by my testifier. Director Smith. Uh, Mr. Chair, Committee members. Um, I believe it's in Ramsey Court because that's the location of, of where the DNR is located. Um, it's the same language that the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has, um, but we can double check on that. Representative Gilman. Um, just wanted to see if there would ever be any conversations that could happen around that, if that's, if that's how it is or not. So thank you. Representative Heisman. Thank you, Chair. Um, Representative Koslowski, uh, I'm looking at line 6.1, actions to compel performance. And I'm trying to better understand exactly how that would work, um, especially, especially in the part regarding municipalities, and that's down in line 6.6. .6. Um, maybe you could expound on that uh, and what that would look like. Director Smith. Uh, Mr. Chair, committee members, Representative Heitzman, um, this particular section is, it, first of all, any permittee that receives an administrative penalty order has the right to appear before a judge to request that the contents of that particular order be reviewed. Um, so that particular judge within the scope of that order um, would, would rule whether the department was, was fair, equitable, appropriate in issuing that particular administrative penalty order if the penalty was reasonable. Um, and if the violations were warranted and to support the, the issuance of the order. Um, so that, that judge would rule on whether um, the scope of the, the, the particular order was adequate and appropriate. Um, and then it would require um, 
the violator to do whatever was necessary in order to come back into compliance to pay the penalty and to perform the corrective actions. Um, to my understanding, the portion related to the municipality is um, if that particular municipality has to go through certain processes in order to expend funds that they would have to potentially forego those in order to do what is needed to comply with that order. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. And I think you were starting to get at the answer to the question in, in that, but at the same time, I, looking around the table, I don't know that anybody fully understands what you were trying to explain, and I'm certainly one of them, and I'm not trying to be obnoxious, it's just, that seems really complicated, and if we're gonna be writing new language here, I'd really like to fully understand exactly how that's gonna work. And uh, I, I think that there are plenty of folks in the room probably that understand how the court functions and how court orders function, but how that process would actually work in, in, in relation to a municipality, I think we're a little blurry yet. If there could be more, I'd sure appreciate it. Director Smith, then I've yep. got four people on the list. Yep. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Heinzman, so if, for example, the department were to issue an administrative penalty order to an irrigator for irrigating without a permit, and that irrigator decided to appeal that administrative penalty order, um, that individual or a company would appear in front of a judge, and the judge would decide whether or not the, the, the violation occurred, if the penalty was reasonable, if the corrective actions were warranted, and then the regulated party, if, depending on the judge's order, would have to um, comply with that decision. And the bill is going to judiciary. Thank you, Chair. I, I think that there's definitely gonna need to be more eyes on this. I, I'm not, not expecting this committee to function as judiciary, but it would be nice if there was a broader explanation. Representative Edelson, then Representative Schultz, then Representative Vang, and then Representative Brand. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll keep mine brief. Um, Ms. Smith, you had, and thank you, Representative Klausley, for the bill. This is a weird position to be in. Um, I guess, you know, Ms. Smith, you had talked about um, violations and also repeat violations, and I'm wondering if you could give maybe two or three examples of people that are making violations, what areas, what industries, and where we're seeing repeat violations, because water, I value, and I think our entire state realizes this is like our most important <coughs> natural resource, so I, I really genuinely want to know how this is working for you. Director Smith? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Edelson, um, yes, I, th I think an example of, of what we'd seen, what we've seen that would constitute a repeat violation would be, for example, um, an irrigator who's irrigating without a permit. And um, in several instances, we've, the DNR has issued um, a cease and desist order, which that irrigator did not comply with um, and continued to, to operate, to continue to irrigate. And so I think that would be an example of, of where we've seen repeat violations. Um, we would judge each individual situation based on its merits. And, and perhaps in some cases we would start with, you know, a notice of violation, which this bill would give us a variety of tools, not just penalty carrying tools. And so, for example, if we issued a notice of violation and ordered someone to stop and they did not comply, we would perhaps consider moving to an administrative penalty order which would have more teeth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and Ms. Smith, I'd be very supportive of that uh, penalty because the reality is, is there's those permits are there for a reason. If people are violating them, and I'm also looking at the duty of candor language, um, which is making clear to me that obviously the DNR is experiencing false statements or uh, failure to disclose, things like this. So uh, very supportive, thank you. All right, thank you, Chair Hansen, and to Representative Edelson for a, a great question for what does this look like? I think, um, you know, one of the compelling examples that illustrated some of the things that are happening and, and to the testifier earlier, um, you know, there's data that was put out by the Minnesota DNR that uh, talked about it was 96% of water permits uh, are like irrigators, like farmers, sustainable practices, right, um, who are at 90% percent are not utilizing the full um, water level that they could with their permits. It's really 4% who are making some of these egregious violations. Um, up in northwestern Minnesota, there was a city 
uh, Warren in 2021, where we saw um, the quadrupling of agricultural irrigation um, that then plummeted during the drought in one of the most historic droughts since I was born in 88. Um, and that actually led to the city uh, needing to take action with DNR because they were fearful that the water supply was going to be no more. Um, and so at that point, the DNR did step in. <clears throat> um, and so we know that, you know, farmers need to keep their crops alive, but also for the health and well being of entire communities. And what we see when the water supplies like this are depleted is that um, the overdrawing actually can create to pollutants seeping into the soil that potentially contaminate drinking water. And as we know, um, that we have to take all folks into account when we're looking at our economy, we're looking at feeding uh, the state and our country. Um, and so those things all have to be balanced and this bill seeks to just give those tools to be able to actually um, take non, uh, you know, monetary action uh, and help folks with education bring into compliance up to really tackling the really egregious violations. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Kozlowski. Uh, this this uh, bill has great impacts to the people in my district. Uh, in fact, our, our testifiers from my district uh, today, and uh, and I appreciate the the comments that you just made about having balance, and that's key and important uh, to this discussion because it directly impacts food security uh, for our state, nation, and world. And uh, and so my my question for you is, uh, what consideration are you willing to give? to uh, provide for agriculture and farmers in a time of drought. Thank you, so, uh, sorry, the I chair. Chair Hansen and Representative uh, Schultz. Um, you know, that is for me as carrying this bill um, and working with the agency, I know that um, is very important in centering farmers and working with cities as we've talked about uh, the questions that were raised um, and some current concerns and also the support that's needed to both balance, um, right, tackling the, the violations that also bolstering and supporting farmers in the things that they need, especially as we face climate change and more extreme weather, whether it's uh, flooding or it's drought. Um, so I would say that we will look forward to continuing those conversations. Um, I know that I will commit and uh, Director Smith here to follow up and make sure that uh, we, we do strike that balance with this legislation. Uh, thank you for recognizing me, Mr. Chair. I, it, this is key to, to food security. Um, the, the, the farms in my district, uh, and a single farm in my district, provides for 15 million meals a year. Um, and when, when we put forward a piece of legislation like this, that can directly impact the entirety of those 15 million meals. So let's, uh, I, I I hear you and I appreciate your pledge to work with the stakeholders to ensure that agriculture and food security isn't detrimentally impacted by this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess just a informational question about um, uh, Director, how do you guys determine the amount of uh, water taken? Are there objective measures and do farmers participate in that process? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Vang, um, before even issuing a permit, the DNR works, close, works closely with the permittee. Um, they do a series of tests on, on their wells, on their aquifers, and they request a certain permitted amount, which the DNR then um, studies um, in great detail to make sure that they're not impacting, for example, neighboring wells, neighboring communities, other farms in the area. So we go through that pr process before even issuing a permit. And as part of the permitting process, every year the water user reports to the DNR how much water they've used that previous year. And does it seem like those permits seem to, irrigators and farmers tend to use appropriate levels of the permits majority of the time? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Vang, um, yes, I think we don't see very often that um, permittees go above and beyond their, their permit, and we certainly understand during times of drought that um, additional water may need to be used, and so there are some occasions where um, users go slightly over, and we do see occasionally that um, permittees will go excessively over, and I think that's part of the reason for needing a spectrum of tools. 
Represent brand. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, real quick, um, in some testimony that was handed to us in the packet today, it talked about how there were 6.5 billion gallons of water that was overused or taken above what the permit allowed. To give a little bit of perspective, Mille Lacs is about 132,000 square acres, and that would be equivalent to taking two inches out of Mille Lacs Lake. And that's a lot of water. Uh, that would be equivalent to 9,971 Olympic pools. Um, and so my question uh, for Director Smith is, what is the total amount that we are allowing permittees to use in a year in Minnesota? The reason I'm asking this is because water in Minnesota is like oil in Texas. The problem is that we have it all on our surface and our subsurface, oil's in the ground down there. And you know we have a, a right to protect our legacy. And as we know, water is life in our, in our area of the world and we need it for life. And so um, can you just give me an idea of how many gallons of water we are allowing folks to take in a year? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Brand, I don't have that information at my fingertips, but that's a great question. We can get back to you with that answer. Okay. Representative Heinzman, uh, the last question on this bill, and then we'll vote. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I'm just trying to listen to the conversation. It's something that uh, maybe does need to be brought up and be discussed a little bit, maybe not uh, beyond, uh, maybe in this current committee, maybe in another one, but it does sound like we're trying to get after issues that have taken place with non-permit holders. So if we're, if we're talking about that, then I wish the scope of the bill would address that. If we need stiffer penalties in cases where someone hasn't had a permit and uh, acted inappropriately, I would like to see something more specifically directed to that if that's the issue we're trying to get at. Representative Kozlowski to close. Great, thank you so much, uh, Chair Hansen. And uh, you know, just real quick to that, I'd say that we are talking about um, both and it is permit holders. Um, one large potato uh, corporate company actually represented 23% of the draw of that violation. Um, so I think it's really clear that in this conversation, we're headed to additional committee stops and we'll continue to have the conversation that um, is going to get us to have the solutions that are needed to face our future head on. So thank you so much and I uh, look would ask you to consider supporting this and referring it to the next committee. I renew my motion that House File 1873 as amended uh, be re-referred to the Judiciary Finance and Policy Committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Nay. Ayes have it. The motion is adopted. On to the next committee. Next up, uh, Representative Stevenson, House File 2388. Upper Sioux Agency State Park transfer required and report required. I was going to allow until uh, 3.35, but I think we're going to go a little longer than that. So, Representative uh, Stevenson to the bill. I, I move that House File 2388 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, I am uh, immensely proud to bring before you House File 2388, a bill to return the Upper Sioux Agency State Park uh, to the uh, people of the Upper Sioux uh, Nation. And I'm not gonna say a whole lot because I have uh, the honor to be sitting next to uh, Chair uh, Kevin uh, Jenswold, who I think will do a much better job of um, articulating the story uh, leading up uh, to today's hearing and the importance of this bill. I'll just simply say that um, when I think about all of the reasons why it's important for us to pass this bill, I always just keep coming back to that thing that there are, are points in time where we have the opportunity to do the right thing. And this is the right thing to return this land at this time. And so uh, Mr. Chair, with that, I'd, I'll just let Chair Jenswold speak. Chair Jenswold, welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee. I'm uh, Chairman Kevin Jenswold of the uh, Yellow Medicine Dakota people. <coughs> Excuse me, one of four fairly recognized Dakota tribes that are bordered or bounded by the state of Minnesota. We are acknowledged in the Federal Register 25 as the Upper Sioux Community, which is uh, 
in direct uh, relationship to uh, the state park referenced in uh, House File 2388. I've served in a capacity as tribal chairman for the last 18 years, and 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 it's uh, I've had the opportunity to make the request to three different administrations for the return of original tribal Dakota land to the Yellow Medicine people. I thank uh, Representative Stevenson and all of these co-authors to this bill because this is a culmination of 18 years of effort that brought me here to this, this uh, desk today. But it truly is a story that is 160 years in the making and um, the magnitude of the moment that I sit here in front of all you honored um, lawmakers to speak not only on behalf of 550 tribal members but um, all of those that are yet to come to be born to this world but also to be the singular voice for those ancestors who were at the Upper Sioux Agency at its inception, who lived and died there, and engaged in a war with the United States when, when terms of a treaty were no longer viable in our eyes. And I'm not a historian, but I think the context of, of what we're talking about here it goes back to the Traverse de Sioux Treaty between the Dakota people and the United States of America in which um, Dakota lands were negotiated away to the United States ultimately um, to create the state of Minnesota. I've had the uh, opportunity to to participate in a lot of these called tribal state relation trainings as a panelist and, and, and I've, I've found over the years that not many people even know that Manishota is a Dakota word, you know, and so that's why I think it's incumbent upon me to try to offer to all of you a perspective of this treaty and the negotiations that led to a formation of two separate agencies, one called the Upper Sioux Agency and one called the Lower Sioux Agency. And that is direct, um, directly because of the, the treaty that was negotiated that these two venues, if you will, would be the distribution site for payments and annuities to the Dakota people in exchange for the lands that they gave to the United States so that the settlers would have a home. Part of that agreement we made as Dakota people, we call it the Chanumpa. In today's terms, the European calls it a peace pipe because what it was when it was part of those negotiations, it was always seen as a sign of peace. That, that is a misconception of what that sacred instrument is. We made the deal with the United States with that sacred Chanumpa, which is, when we did that, we made our commitment to our creator. And because of that, it was very difficult for our people to then say, how could the opposing people, the United States, not honor that commitment the same way we did? So we were directed to these agencies to live and to set aside the way of life that we had prior to that, to become sedentary and dependent upon these annuities. And if anybody knows any part of that history, the United States didn't treat us in an honorable manner and, and, and those annuities and payments were somehow misdirected or lost in transit and all of those things, but yet, the Dakota people, we waited because we made that commitment to our creator. And over time, we became apparent that this was no longer a viable uh, option because our children were dying of starvation. 
And I'll bring up this point, and I hope that you all will carry this forward and remember what I say. Our women, or our old people, and our children starve to death at a place called the Upper Sioux Agency. Based on the commitment United States did not honor with our people. This is the state park that we are now talking about. We went to war with the United States out of desperation, being decimated as a people. A war that was very short-lived, a war that occurred right on those lands. If any of you know history, the Battle of Wood Lake was, was started right across that Yellow Medicine River. The European version will say that General Sibley thwarted an ambush by these Dakota warriors and he saved his, 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 his soldiers. Our version of the story would say that there were hungry Dakota people on a, on a trail called the Lacoparo Trail. We were gathering um, rotten potatoes that we could take back to the agency so that we could at least have some food. But that's a side note. But on those lands, there are 13 known to the United States and the scientists, 13 known burial sites, and many, many more known only to tribal members. There are many, many sacred places where there are sacred sites of prayer, sacred sites of courtship, sacred sites of celebration and death all encompassed in the 1,400 acres that is controlled by the state of Minnesota. And the reason I've spent these 18 years in this effort on behalf of our people according to what I know the state park was made for two purposes to interpret and preserve that story but also the second component was for a place for all Minnesotans to recreate. You know, across an ocean, there are places there, terms like genocide and Holocaust. And there are places there that are, are treated in a much different manner. And it's such that I don't believe that it's in human nature to dance upon the graves of a vanquished foe or to celebrate and um, commercialize those things when just adjacent lands those same people still live today. The people that have been in that river valley for 10,000 years. We live that life. I've been in this world since 1964, probably when that creation of that park was around that time. A wise man told me yesterday, he says, when we bring this to the attention of the state, we're going to have to be prepared for the vitriol that ensues, and, and, and that is true. The paper, one of the local papers contacted me a couple days ago, and I said, out of respect for you as lawmakers and as respect for the state government, I got no comment. I'm going to bring my testimony to the state and, and allow them to do their job as decision makers. But a story came out anyways, you know, and it is slanted, in my opinion, to that, to that um, end that somehow we're asking for something more than consideration. Each of you and the Dakota people, we come together right here at this moment in time. The Creator has brought us here, like Representative Stevenson says, Maybe today is the right time to make this transfer. In my mother's language, there is no word for coincidence, and I will bring you to 2018. 
at that point in time, part of the road, State Highway 67, fell off the side of the hill that bisected that uh, state park, making it um, impassable and that the eastern side of the park was now separated by that road. And the only way to access the eastern half of that that park was across 10 miles around across a bridge that uh, MnDOT is now going to decommission as well in the near future. And so that too will basically isolate that eastern portion of that park, making it, rendering it worthless as, as a campground. And um, also in that time, Lower Sioux Agency Part of their lands were returned to them under the same conditions that um, the upper agency was created and under the conditions that the people lived. You know, the, the state engaged them as well. So it reinvigorated my commitment to make this happen. Governor Walls and the Upper Sioux Tribal Council made a trip to Washington, D.C. because there's a, what's called the Land Water Conservation Fund that has, 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 has a say in this. And we wanted to make sure that if, if this is what um, the moment in time that we all agree that this is proper and just, that we would do our best as a tribal nation to assist the state in, in a seamless transfer. You know, that occurred as well, Governor. Walls came there and he walked upon that land on a cold and rainy day and I think he understood what I'm trying to convey to all of you today. Starvation is not an overnight process. Our ancestors endured that to the point that we went to war out of desperation. I don't think that it's right and righteous and just that there are picnic tables there where people will go on a Sunday and it's good, they have a good time. But there's never been in the 60 some years an a, a accurate interpretation. It's always been sanitized or homogenized or maybe even ignored because history and truth are sometimes ugly, and this is the most ugliest moment in the state of Minnesota's history as it, as it reflects upon the Dakota people was at that time when that agency was a place of death and despair. I will say that it was a concentration camp. I will say that it was a place of genocide. I will say that it was a holocaust of a magnitude that we're Nobody can imagine unless it's your people that will suffer that. And I offer all of this to you in a short time, 160 years of, of this pain that my people have endured and especially when I can look out the window of my office and see the battlefields and hear the suffering Nothing worse than hearing a baby cry when they're hungry. And that is very important. And we're all here today, like I said, at the grace of our Creator. And we can make a monumental shift in the narrative that's put forth for all of our children and their children's moving forward. And I ask you for consideration the DNR supports this. The governor supports this. I believe there are five or six co-authors as well. And this is not just spontaneous. And I will address, and I don't know if it's proper or not, but I do know that uh, the mayor of Granite Falls has, has provided uh, testimony. And I would like to refute some of those comments that he made into the uh, paper the other day where he makes statement there's not been any conversation with the Upper Sioux community. I, I, I would totally disagree with that. I've been knowing him over 18 years. He's been mayor longer than that. I know under his, he's, he's under the chairman of the Friends of the Upper Sioux State Park. That's, that's the title he's using here. But he is known 
all of these years our desire. So I think that uh, I have to bring that forth to your attention because that is additional testimony. And if he truly was a friend of the state park and wanted to make it known in an accurate manner what occurred there, yeah, he would be sitting here with me today. But again, I just want to say to you, the truth just lays there. It is what it is. We're, none of us were there. I've heard that many times. Get over it. None of us were there. I wasn't there. That's true. But we are here today. And I ask if you're for your consideration on behalf of the Dakota people that you would be willing to make it right and make it known that if this truly is one Minnesota, as I heard the governor say, then it has to include the first Minnesotans. I say thank you all, and if there's any questions, I would be honored to uh, address them if I could. Thank you, and uh, we do have the commissioner of DNR uh, to testify as well. Thank you. Commissioner. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, um, I'm Sarah Stroman. I'm the commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Um, I'm going to be really brief here, but there are three um, points that I wanted to share with the committee. One is um, I'm sure you're all aware that we take great pride in being the manager of Minnesota's state park system. It is not uh, lightly that we take and enter into a conversation about transferring one of our state parks. Um, this, as, as I think you've heard Chairman Jenshold talk about, is an extremely unique case. The Upper Sioux Agency State Park was established uh, for two purposes. One was to um, preserve and interpret the historic agency site. And I think as you've heard Chairman Jenshold, um, there is another story and there is a story that needs to be told by the Dakota people that we as the state of Minnesota cannot tell. Um, the second purpose was to provide recreation opportunities in the Minnesota River Valley. And I would offer that there are many places uh, where we can do this. Um, the, third, the third reason um, that you know, we're coming to this with a commitment of support is the state of repair at the Upper Sioux Agency State Park is one that needs significant investment from the state of Minnesota in order to continue to operate it as a park. Um, the visitor center is in uh, need of repair to remain operational or probably a rebuild. Um, we have campgrounds along the river that flood. And as Chairman Jensvold talked about, um, the, the biggest problem is uh, there is now a sinkhole in the highway that accesses uh, the park from, from one uh, side of it to the other. And, uh, and it, it is not uh, any foregone conclusion that that road will be uh, rebuilt in a way that allows the connectivity with the park. And so for um, those reasons and um, because we believe it is the right thing to do, the DNR and, and Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan have committed to working with the Upper Sioux community um, through the process on this transfer. Um, it is a process that has to happen. Um, this bill is, is an important step, but it is one step um, the other steps will include the public outreach that we will do with uh, the community around Granite Falls and Minnesotans across the state. And in fact, our regional director, Scott Raimhelt, was meeting with Mayor Smigluski this morning. Um, and then as Chairman Jenswold mentioned, uh, this, this park is covered uh, with a federal encumbrance due to the Land and Water Conservation Fund. And so there is a process <laughs> similar to the one we went through with the Lower Sioux community um, that will involve us working with the National Park Service and Department of Interior to remove um, that lock on encumbrance. And as DNR, we will be responsible for then um, finding replacement recreation lands that uh, will be available to Minnesotans. And we will do that, I think, both in terms of meeting uh, the specific terms of the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and then part of that outreach we'll be having with the community is what else can we do with the investment that we would have had to make in the park uh, in order to provide recreational opportunity in that Granite Falls area. Um, so, Mr. Chair, with that, um, I will conclude my comments here and, and just share my support uh, of this bill moving forward at this time and be happy to answer any questions. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify for or against this bill? Anyone else? 
Uh, questions from members? Representative uh, Gilman and then Representative Jordan. Thank you, Chair. So um, you briefly mentioned uh, going to Washington. Um, so if these lands are transferred to the Upper Sioux community, um, is, the in, is the federal government involved in at all in the process of this? And, and if so, what is the process? Sorry. Representative Stevenson. Yeah, and I'll just say, I know that it was the chairman's uh, comments about going to DC and with the governor, I know, and we, we talked about that at the time it was happening, and he can maybe tell you more about uh, what was involved in that. There are There is a federal encumbrance that we were discussed, that the commissioner discussed, that the chairman mentioned, uh, that is uh, in the process of being worked through, but I, I don't know if the chairman wants to briefly discuss that as well. Chair Jensvold. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative. Um, I think that, um, Excuse me. What was your question again? Um, Representative Gilman. Thank you. So if the federal government is at all involved in this process, I, you mentioned going to Washington. So are you asking not only us to sit at the table, but is the federal government sitting at the well, table? One of the dynamics, and I know there's probably lawyers on your committee there probably, uh, you know, would uh, relish the opportunity to I don't to think we to have discuss any this, but um, no, 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 no. oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh I, I apologize. I do Joking. believe it. I'm a lawyer. Next to you. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> but um, I, I would imagine that transfer would take place, and, and, and it probably would be turned into trust status again, turned over to the United States. Uh, unfortunately, part of our our history is that as, as tribal nations, we are wards of the federal government. And if you look in, we used to look in a dictionary, but now I think you Google it, that means incompetent, you know? And that, that is an antiquated interpretation that still exists. But we are, we are wards of the federal government, and as such, it probably would be um, turned over to the federal government. There's a potential argument to be made that that is original reservation that the Dakota people reserve for themselves in the Traverse to Sioux Treaty, but again, that's a lawyer question. But um, we, we may have those discussions with the Department of Interior and the National Park Service to that extent that it would include the federal component and they are aware of that and we've had um, several conversations with them to assist in this transfer. Thank you, Chair. Chairs. Representative Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Stevenson, for bringing a really good bill forward to the committee today. And most of all, thank you to Chairman Jonesvold for being here. It's an honor to have you um, and have someone of your statute here um, testifying for us. My question is actually for Commissioner Stroman. Um, sorry to make you come back up. But um, it sounds like there are some pretty significant issues with the infrastructure, specifically as it relates to the road and visitor center and all of that. Um, and I, I, I guess my question is, are we, as part of this land back, are we also saddling um, people with expenses? Um, do we need to also make sure that we're providing resources to fix this road um, or do reclamation for existing buildings to, to return to the land the way um, management would, would um, that the, the, the management of the um, band would like it. So what are there other changes that need to happen apart from just the land ownership itself? Commissioner Stroman. Um, Mr. Chair and Representative Jordan, again, Sarah Stroman, um, Commissioner at Minnesota DNR. Um, a couple things. Um, the road, um, I believe MnDOT uh, is working on that issue and, and trying to determine what the um, alignment and path will be. So I don't, I don't, I can't answer the questions about reclamation of that. That would be a question for MnDOT and whatever conversations they might be having um, with, with the community. Um, as far as the buildings um, go, I think we are probably not quite yet at that point of the conversation about um, we want to go through the process to make sure that we can remove the encumbrances. Um, I, should, I should mention that in addition to the federal law con encumbrance, there is a a bond encumbrance on the visitor center and the 
defeasance of that is included um, in the governor's budget and I believe was in the bonding bill um, that passed the House. So that is on its way to remove the encumbrances and then I think it is a conversation that um, is ongoing between the department and um, Chairman Jensvold and his council about what we do with the, the remaining structures on the land. Okay, Chairman Jensvold said he could address the road. Chairman um, I have a, Highway 67 has been uh, renamed or, or relocated uh, around that area. And now it's a dead end road that is identified as uh, State Highway 167. I live right on that road. So it dead ends right at the, at the, the slippage where that road is. And, and talking with uh, uh, Mr. Hughesby, I believe, uh, um, I don't know, 8 Section 8 or um, is um, he's the superintendent and, and there's no plans to to invest any more dollars into that road. It's a thirty to fifty million dollar project just to the and on the again on the other side that bridge is going to be decommissioned as well, further isolating that and, and making the eastern side inaccessible. So it is now a dead end road. Representative Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chairman, for that. Um, I just want to make sure that as we're I, I, I think this is a great I hear a lot from my constituents that they are interested in what the state of Minnesota is doing to, to repair the harm that the state of Minnesota did to our sovereign tribal nations, specifically questions about land back. I think this is a great example of that. I just want to make sure we're not also, as we're, we're doing the right thing, we're not also transferring a lemon uh, to someone who doesn't deserve it. So thank you for your work on this. Thank you, Representative Stevenson. Representative Heinzel. Thank you, Chair. My questions would also be for DNR. Commissioner Stroman. Mr. Stroman, uh, Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, so I'll just start with a letter that was referenced, and it may or may not have uh, bearing on this conversation, but there were a couple of questions that uh, I had when I when I heard about it and checked. It. So the the claim is that this uh, Friends of the Upper Sioux Agency State Park Group is saying that there hasn't been any kind of public meetings. Um, now, there may be individuals that may have been aware, as I think was mentioned, but I would like to just know if there has been public meetings and, and there's been engagement and feedback from folks in this area, or if it is actually, as, as the letter suggests, that the bill is only coming now just recently in this idea in the last week or so. Uh, as as uh, as legislators, we're always accused of putting the cart before the horse, and I'm not trying to create any uh, difficulties here. But I would like to know that you know we're, we've we've done due diligence in making sure that we've talked to everybody and have an idea where where folks are at on this. Commissioner Stroman. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Heinzman, thank you for that question, and I apologize for vacating the chair too soon. Um, so one of the points um, that I wanted to make about that public outreach and public process was because that is um, something that we typically do if we are um, thinking of making a change to lands that we manage. Um, we have not done uh, those public meetings to date, partly because we weren't at that point in the process where we had a specific enough proposal. I think the point that I was trying to make earlier is there's still a long process. This land is not going to transfer tomorrow. This bill is an important step to lay out the intent to uh, begin that process, but it is the start of that, not the end of it. So um, as I said this morning too, our, our regional director had a conversation uh, with the mayor of Granite Falls, who was also the chairman of the um, uh, Friends of Upper Sioux Agency State Park. That was an in-person meeting following um, a number of, of back and forth phone conversations they've had. We will um, be commencing you know, shortly um, a more formal public process that will talk both about um, disposition of the park, but also uh, conversations about what the community, what kinds of recreation opportunities to the point of that purpose of recreational opportunities in the Minnesota River Valley can Minnesota DNR support. So that conversation, those conversations would happen and then I would just add that um, while a formal process hasn't commenced as Chairman Jenswold said, 
uh, the request from the Upper Sioux community has not been a secret. The, the fact that these conversations have been going on for the last, um, you know, 15 years or, or more um, is not new. So I think this is not a surprise uh, in terms of um, the, the conversation and a step moving forward. But we do need to, to still start and complete that public process. And that's part of what I wanted to do is commit to you all that we will do that. Heisman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner, I would also just like to confirm, because it does sound like the legislation is somewhat hastily being uh, offered. Are the timelines in this bill, are they workable? Commissioner Stroman. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Heinzman, um, yes, they are workable. The, the main um, point of, of this bill uh, indicates that we need to come back to a report with the steps um, that are laid out. And so, you know, that is, that is doable. Um, I think the one piece that uh, directs us to convey uh, any unencumbered lands um, more immediately, for all practical purposes, there are no <laughs> unencumbered lands. So, um, you know, that, that becomes um, less of an issue in the bill. The focus is really on the intent to transfer and then the coming back with, with the report. Representative Heinzman, we're laying it over. We're going to need a fiscal note. Um, there's going to be more conversation about that. Mr. Mr. Chair, Heinzman. one final uh, thought, I guess, just as I'm looking at lines 1.6 through lines 1.8, which read the Commissioner of Natural Resources must convey for no consideration at all state owned land within the boundaries of the Upper Sioux Agency Park to the Upper Sioux community by September 15th, 2023. Those conversations, Commissioner, that you mentioned that are going to happen at some point is what I'm hearing. Would that have any bearing on the language in this bill? Because it does sound like this is a foregone conclusion. Commissioner Stroman. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Heinzman, um, the legislature has the prerogative um, to direct this. This is the same way that the transfer uh, to the Lower Sioux community began was with a directive from the legislature. So, you know, certainly um, if, you know, depending on the public comment, that's something we can come back and share. But I think what we're hearing uh, in this bill is there is an interest from uh, at least the bill author and some portion of the legislature to see this transfer done. There is clearly a request from the Upper Sioux community and uh, the DNR and, and the governor are supportive of that request and committed to work through the process. Representative Stevenson to close. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I just want to note, and Representative Heinzman, you may have um, misspoken just a little bit there because you added uh, the, the, the date onto the first sentence. There's a period after the word community there. So the, that transfer does not occur by September 15th, 2023. Uh, the way you stated that made it sound like the first sentence included the date. It doesn't. The date is part of the next sentence, saying that anything that's unencumbered uh, has to uh, has to be it has to be identified, uh, and then um, by that date, and then it has to be transferred if it's unencumbered by December first, twenty twenty three. And you heard the commissioner say that really there aren't any lands that would fall into that section of the bill, which is one of the things that we're going to be talking about to lead over. And I think uh, the chair also mentioned something I did want to draw the committee's attention to, which is that there will be uh, cost associated with this because of uh, the need to replace uh, the land, uh, as we discussed. Uh, and, and I think the chair mentioned a, a fiscal note, and so there, there will be a cost to this. And I just wanted to uh, appreciate that for the committee. But otherwise, I thank the committee for its time. I know that we went considerably over what you anticipated, and we appreciate your patience and, uh, and attention to this very, very important issue. Uh, and with that, I just ask for the committee support. Thank you, Representative Stevenson and Chair Jensvold. We wanted to make the time to make this work. Chair Jensvold. Appreciate everything. Thank you so much. And Representative Stevenson, the House file number is 2388 if members wanted to co-author it, which I will do. Uh, the bill is laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Uh, next bill up is House File 2354, Representative Purcell. So members and the audience, we are going to try to go through as much as we can. Um, I am going to ask that we have a lot of testifiers on this particular bill, if they can keep their uh, suggestion or their comments to one minute. 
uh, that we can try to get back on schedule. Representative Purcell, uh, would you like to move that House File 2354 be laid over for possible inclusion? Yes, Mr. Chair, so moved. Uh, Representative Purcell, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. House File 2354 directs the Board of Water and Soil Resources to create a statewide electronic database where notice is published for petition drainage projects and reestablishment of records as defined in Minnesota Statute 103E. There are three key issues with the current public notice requirements in this statute that the Drainage Registry Information Portal would address. First, the current public notice requirements for drainage projects limit mandatory notice to the project petitioners and those in the immediate jurisdiction of the local drainage authority rather than the broader public. However, drainage projects can and have fundamentally altered the hydrology of many of our public waters in ways that have led to increased erosion and downstream flooding, increased nutrient loads from cropland runoff, and the destruction of thousands of acres of wetland, along with their critical ecosystem functions. Because of these impacts to public resources, it's important to have a centralized statewide database where the broader public, downstream landowners, tribal nations, local government units, and regulatory agencies can learn about new proposed drainage projects before these impacts occur. Secondly, it's important to modernize public notice requirements through a digitized statewide database. Current mandatory public notice requirements are by mail, and while some drainage authorities do maintain a website, this is not consistent across the state. Without a centralized electronic database, members of the public who want to learn about drainage project, projects must navigate the 87 plus different drainage authority jurisdictions, only some of which have websites. This is an undue burden on the public for projects with the, uh, with the proven potential to significantly impact public water resources. Finally, how public notice happens today isn't until it's time to review the preliminary engineer's report, at which point significant landowner expenses have already been invested into the project. Understandably, there is more resistance to consider project alternatives at this stage once good money has been spent. Earlier public notice in, its, in a centralized statewide database would allow members of the public, tribal nations, local governments, water suppliers, and other groups to identify public resources that may be impacted by a, by a proposed project. In addition, earlier public notice would facilitate regulatory review by local and state agencies, especially the Department of Natural Resources and the Board of Water and Soil Resources. It would give these agencies more time to review proposed projects, ensure regulatory requirements such as mandatory environmental review or public water permits are met, and identify project alternatives that would perhaps better protect public water resources. With that, Chair Hansen, I would like to turn it over to my testifiers. First up, Carly Griffith, Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. Welcome and state your name for the record. Thank you, Chairman Hansen, Chair Hansen, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Carly Griffith, and I am the Water Program Director at the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. MCEA supports House File 2354 because it fills a basic transparency gap in Minnesota drainage law and provides timely notice of petition drainage projects to affected downstream landowners, local governments, tribal nations, water suppliers, et cetera. Um, I'm not going to belabor the reasons why the current public notice requirements are inadequate because Representative Purcell has just summarized them effectively. What I would like to use my minute to discuss is, a, is the fact that MCEA, the Isaac Walton League, and Friends of the Minnesota River Valley have, um, have addressed this issue, have brought this issue to the drainage work group to discuss over the past year. Since the bill's initial introduction last session, these groups have issued multiple discussion requests to drainage work group members in April and August 2022 and January of 2023 to work through the substantive concerns and try to achieve consensus on how to modernize public notice for drainage. We appreciate that the issue was discussed at the drainage work group in January and February of this year, and we have listened to and responded to the substantive concerns that were raised in those discussions. Towards that end, this bill does not include repairs unless they are subject to a reestablishment of records, petition, or order. And the time of notice has been moved from within 10 days of the receipt of a petition to 10 days of the appointment of a project engineer. So we respectfully submit that though DW drainage work group consensus was not achieved, this bill language as written does respond to the substantive concerns that were raised by drainage work group members. 
We also contend that while early public notice in a statewide electronic database will help to further early coordination goals from the Department of Natural Resources, it is primarily about transparency with the broader public rather than a regulatory review process and should be kept distinct from the early coordination subcommittee and the drainage work group. Thank you um, for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Uh, Jerry Wilhelm. Welcome and state your name for the record. Thank you, Chairman. My name is Jerry Wilhelm. Uh, from the late 1970s until the early 1990s, I was the Martin County attorney. I, uh, Martin County is in the Minnesota's River Basin and it's one of the most heavily drained counties in the state. We maintained back then about 286 miles simply of open ditches, thousands of miles of county ditches and many, many more thousands of miles of private ditches connected to those. We, I come here today in support of this bill because the bill will give citizens access to critical drainage matters in an economical and efficient way. At present, for example, my group, the Minnesota River Collaborative, in order to find out whether a drainage proceeding is started, has to call or visit the website of 33 different counties. We, it's an impossible task. Uh, Drainage law already requires the benefited or damaged landowners uh, within the affected area be notified. Simply posting the same notice on a single website does not seem burdensome. Counties already post numerous documents on their websites, including in some cases pending notices of drainage projects. The bill would simply collect those all in one spot. Our, why do we care about this? Why, why do people who aren't benefited by these ditches or aren't damaged by them, why should they care? What business is it of ours? Well, from our perspective in the Minnesota Liber River Collaborative, we are trying to protect the health and future of the Minnesota River, widely believed to be one of the dirtiest in the state. The bill would aid the effort in cleaning up that river that the MPCA has said must be cleaned up to the extent of 50% of its current sediment load. People downstream suffer from that sediment load. The bill would assist downstream landowners who often don't get official notice of an improvement project since they're outside the benefited area. Despite the lack of notice, it is these landowners who often pay the price for increased flows. As water levels in the Minnesota grow higher and higher, for example, downstream flooding occurs more often. A member of the collaborative who farms downstream, uh, far downstream near, near Shakopee, uh, loses land every year. He would certainly benefit by knowing about a, pro a drainage project upstream of him that doesn't benefit him, doesn't really damage him, but is causing flooding on his land. The bill provides a place for those folks to get such a notice. So this bill helps everyone. Counties can be assured that interested parties get involved at the beginning and not the end of the process. Groups and individuals concerned about clean water can get early notice of the project as well, as can downstream landowners. Thank you for your time, Mr. Chairman. Members, I'll stand for questions. Laurie Cox. Welcome, state your name for the record. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Lori Cox. Um, I thank you for the testify, or opportunity to testify today in support of this bill. I farm and lease land to food farmers in Carver County. Our, our land is two parcels away from where the Minnesota River Valley Refuge begins. I serve on the advisory boards for my local water management org the Minnesota Ag Water Quality Certification Program, Board of Directors for Minnesota Institute for Sustainable Ag and Minnesota Ag in the Classroom. This bill allows the public to better understand how drainage and water flowage works in watersheds throughout Minnesota. Public waters can include natural and altered water courses that meet the statutory definition in 103G. Our agencies, MPCA, MDA, MDH, DNR, and Bowser describe water pollutants and impairments via monitoring and reports. Will further change to already impaired waters bring further damage to the same or downstream waterways or bring net new impairments to a given storage or flow area where an individual, an individual resides, runs a business, keeps livestock, or recreates? Your yes vote on this will help ensure Minnesota's direct investment into public transparency and also to meet agency missions. I humbly ask for your support for this bill. Thank you. Ray Bowen, Minnesota Watersheds. Welcome, state your name for the record. Right. 
Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, it's nice to be back. I haven't been here for a while. <laughs> so uh, my name is Ray Bone. I represent the Minnesota Watersheds or Minnesota Association of Watershed Districts. Um, uh, we don't believe this bill is ready for prime time yet. Uh, we've, we've had a number of discussions in the drainage work group and um, I thought we were making really good progress but unfortunately we ran out of time and we asked the proponents of this bill to, to hold off, bring it, bring it back to us this summer and we would continue to work on it but evidently they decided they didn't want to do that. You know, it's really interesting. One of the things that kept coming up in our discussions was, you know, is this bill about the state of Minnesota or is this bill about the Minnesota River? And that's the way it sounds. You know, you're trying to solve a problem or use a statewide solution to solve a problem that maybe is not statewide. And we've got, we've got different entities, for example, up in the Red River Valley you know, we were complimented by the proponents of this legislation about what, how we deal with drainage in the Red River Valley. And our response was, well, why don't we maybe head that direction? Uh, this, this bill doesn't really fix anything uh, in our minds. Uh, and certainly not if the committee goes around the drainage work group before we have a chance to finish our deliberations on this issue and, and bring our recommendations forward. Um, is all that's going to do is do serious harm to the whole process. I've been on the drainage work group since, ninth, I want to I wanna say 2006, whenever it started. And that actually started, that group was started in this, this committee. And frankly, it's one of the better ideas that I've been associated with <laughs> Chair Hansen. Well, Mr. Bowen, I created that. So. Yes, yes you did. And it was one of the better ideas. Uh, and, you know, I, I have people say, well, what have they accomplished? Uh, I mean, I got a whole list of accomplishments here that we've worked on over the years and tried to improve drainage. Uh, a lot of it's very esoteric. And if I tried to explain what it was, I probably, well, I could probably explain it, but you wouldn't have any idea what I'm talking about probably. But anyway, this, um, I think um, I would, uh, it's going to oppose additional, we believe it's going to uh, impose additional cost to landowners. And, you know, with, with drainage, it's actually the landowners that are requesting work. They're the ones that have to pay for it. The watershed district, we don't pay for it out of our general levy or anything like that. It's a separate entity. Uh, and the same thing with the counties. It's treated the same way. So any penny that's spent on drainage is paid for out of the ditch fund or the tile fund. Um, we would like to have more time to sit down and talk to the proponents of this legislation. We, we didn't actually start talking about this in the drainage work group till about September. We didn't even know who the proponents of this legislation was last year when it was proposed. So to say that we've had plenty of time to, to work on this is not true. The last thing we, we worked on uh, was a uh, runoff and sediment based repair cost apportionment option. And that was more of a, instead of the benefit options, we were looking at uh, how can we make it more that the, the user, the ones, who's, the ones who's putting more sediment into the, into the ditch, they should be charged accordingly. And we worked for three and a half years on that. And we fought like heck to get it to get passed, and we did get it passed. And, and, and we think it's, a, it's an option. It's just an alternative. And I think it's headed the right direction from everything I know about e economics. And I don't know a lot, but. Um, I think we're, I think we've gone a minute. So uh, Steve Schmidt, Meeker County. Okay. Thank you. Well, 
I have more to say, but I guess I don't have time. So thank you. Welcome. State your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Steve Schmidt. I'm a second term Meeker County Commissioner, current board chair, and a past member of the Sauk River Watershed Board. I am testifying today on behalf of the Association of Minnesota Counties and the Minnesota Rural Counties. One of our responsibilities as county board is to serve as the local drainage authority, acting as our drainage system's governing body. Current statutory process requires numerous notifications, public hearings, opportunities for meetings, mailings, and other forms of communication. Drainage authorities participate in the drainage work group, or the DWG, and are committed to co collaboration on process improvement. It has been a long-standing practice for the DWG stakeholders to work through issues to reach consensus for recommended changes, changes to the drainage law. Public notice and early coordination need to go hand in hand. All the members of the drainage work group agreed that a subcommittee should be charged with working on an early coordination proposal after the legislative session. Passing legislation that creates early notice without a meaningful way to receive and to react to input will exacerbate the disagreements and the difficulties. It will also damage trust that our engagement at the DWG actually means something and has some teeth and that the participants are willing to make uh, tough choices, difficult choices and reach compromise and consensus. On behalf of AMC and MRC, we would ask that this committee not pass House File 2354 and allow the drainage work group to continue to do its work to develop a plan that not only improves public awareness, but leads to better outcomes. I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify for or against the bill? Anyone else in the audience? Uh, questions from members. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, as you know, Mr. Chair, and maybe some might not, Representative Purcell, I previously to the legislature was a watershed district manager, served at that level for some time. And the kinds of testimony, the things that we're hearing in testimony today, I think uh, are, are likely very well founded. And the drainage work group, which I'm somewhat familiar with in my previous life, um, I, think, I think that is the route that has worked on a number of these, as we've heard in testimony, very complicated issues mm -hmm. and gotten results with stakeholders all at the table, pounding it out, figuring out how to uh, work through some of these, some of these issues. Mm -hmm. And so just, I, I, I really hope, Mr. Chair, Representative Parcell, that, uh, that, those, that those that testified today are, are heard and that the concerns that they're bringing today are are taken very seriously. I didn't hear that if we tweaked this or tweaked that, that this bill would somehow uh, work to uh, benefit the process. If that was said, I missed it. So I don't know that I can say, well, let's just work. I'd love to work with the author to improve it. I don't know that that can be done. It does sound like we have gone through some, some tough times in years past, and the answer, as Chair Hansen suggested, was the answer, which it sounds like you deserve credit, Mr. Chair, the drainage work group. <laughs> You've probably expected that, and I'm delivering. So beyond, beyond these comments, I, I really don't have anything else. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Purcell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Heinzman. Um, Absolutely, I've been having lots of conversations with the folks at the table and those who have not. Um, I do know that in the process within the drainage work group, there have been um, several many compromises that have already come out and are reflected in this bill. So for example, um, their uh, repairs are not included in here. I know there were some uh, letters in your packet that 
uh, were, were worried about that. That's a change that was made um, before this most recent draft. Um, so it's just petitioned repairs. It's not all repairs. Um, um, let's see what else. The uh, later trigger date, I think one of the testifiers talked about that 10 days um, after a different event versus an earlier event. Um, and I really appreciate that the drainage working group uh, when they come forth to support something or not support something, it's consensus, and they are um, in the process of doing that. Um, and they did not reach consensus to this end. So we had some folks who are uh, represented in that group who wrote letters, you know, not in support of this, and then there are some people who are in support of this bill who are in the drainage group who wrote letters in support of it. So um, I appreciate their work, and I think that that is really great and important. We do not have a statutory requirement to um, do as they say. They, they can come and inform us of what we need to do. Um, and I will just... Uh, make a couple of comments. So um, I live in the Cannon River watershed, and this is absolutely a problem in my river. This is not just a Minnesota River problem. Uh, when I was farming, I certainly wanted to know if my field had been tiled and if anyone upstream was changing the uh, hydrology that would impact my business, um, my family. So um, I have just as much right to that information, and if we can have uh, a database housed in a central place that makes it easier for everyone for transparency and democracy. That's what this bill um, aims to get at. Representative Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Purcell, and I'm glad to hear there's been some changes on the repair side of the bill. Um, I still have counties and watersheds reaching out with serious concerns, and I'll uh, kind of echo what Representative Heitzman mentioned. Um, I'm glad to hear Chair Hansen's involvement in this in the past. Um, obviously, the drainage work group feels like they've been bypassed here. And I think, you know, if we're going to have a long-term fix that includes all stakeholders, um, I just can't see how we can bypass the drainage work group. We really need to respect the fact. Otherwise, why do we have them? Um, consensus is what we need there. It's a complicated issue, and we really need to get it right. And really, no question other than the comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is that for some? Thank you for the comment, Representative Burkle. Anyone else? So since my name has been mentioned several times, I just go back to, you know, the original concept here was that it would provide assistance and information. Drainage law is very complex. And over the years, the drainage work group has done that. So it could be a filter, but not a shield. Uh, it's not supposed to stop or start things. It could st start ideas. And over the history of the drainage work group, there has been <coughs> times where nothing was passed, where recommendations came and nothing happened uh, for years. Uh, and the early years, uh, easy stuff was done, and it still took time to get that passed because a lot of this law is very old. Um, it looks like what you have here, Representative Purcell, is transparency. And on transparency, after the drainage work group was created in 06, we had a legislative audit, I believe, in 07 or 08. And that found that some water districts and watershed districts did not even have web pages, even though they were elected or were not elected. So then we had to change the law to tell them that they had to have one, had to have transparency. So the transparency of looking at individual watershed districts or some water districts on the individual basis the legis didn't go through the drainage work group came from the legislature. So with transparency, now when you have not, water doesn't know county boundaries. It's not straight line situation. And so, and farms don't know, they may be in several watersheds mm -hmm. and may be impacted by drainage. So I think asking for information and transparency to help all landowners, uh, whether they are benefiting from the drainage or not, there may be consequences with that drainage further on. So uh, we are laying this bill over. Do uh, you want to close? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a couple of other comments. I, um, I want to thank all the testifiers here, and I look forward to um, continued conversation with them and folks in the drainage work group. I'm really pleased to hear about the runoff sediment basement repair, but I don't think it's either or. I think it's both and. 
Um, and just uh, one additional comment um, about costing landowners more money. I think if done properly, this can save landowners money because they might get uh, less far in the process and have less funds sunk into their projects before they might receive a no back from the drainage authority. Um, so thank you everyone for your thoughtful discussion and uh, I move to lay the bill over for potential inclusion in our omnibus. Representative Purcell renews her motion, House File 2354, be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Bill is laid over. Representative Purcell, House File 2353, the Lowland Conifer Carbon Reserve. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House File 2353 before the committee for possible inc inclusion in an omnibus bill. Representative Purcell, to the bill. Thank you, Chair Hansen. House File 2353 addresses two existential environmental issues and bolsters long-term funding for K-12 education. The environment and education, two issues near and dear to my heart. The Lowland Carbon and Habitat Reserve called for in this bill provides management direction to the DNR to prioritize maintaining carbon stores and habitats which protect a unique and diverse biome on existing public lands. This bill updates management priorities to address 21st century challenges such as climate adaptation. The forested and unforested peatlands of Minnesota represent the largest remaining stores of carbon in the state. It is imperative that we do what we can to adjust management of these areas to reduce the risk of these lands drying out and releasing 10,000 years of stored carbon via slow oxidation or fire. Second, biodiversity protection. These habitats are the least disturbed in our state. These largely intact ecosystems shelter hundreds of species of plants, animals, insects, and other organisms, many of them rare and unique. Protecting these habitats while maintaining existing uses helps maintain biodiversity in these unique and important ecosystems in our state. A couple of quick points about uh, pieces of this bill. Commercial timber, timber harvest may continue in a manner and in locations allowed by law that are sustainable, uh, certified forestry practices and provisions, and existing contracts for resource extraction or management will still be honored. House File 2353 recognizes the fiduciary obligation the state land has to the School Lands Trust and proposes fair compensation to the school trust of our future budget surpluses in a manner that has been used numerous times over the past decades. As the school trust is a permanent feature of state government, the debt can be paid when the funds are available. And now, Chair Hanson, I'd like to turn it over to testifiers. First up, uh, Peter Wagenius, Sierra Club North Star Chapter. Thank you, Chair Hansen, for the opportunity to testify. Um, I'm Peter Regenius, Legislative Director for Sierra Club North Star Chapter. With me today in the audience are multiple members of Sierra Club's Forest and Wildlife Stewards, who collectively brought their expertise to work with Representative Todd Lippert on this bill last year and to work with Representative Purcell this year. Uh, they have met with school trust administrators, as well as leadership of tribal nations who have provided and continue to provide crucial suggestions on content. I will note in your packets you have letters of support from Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, as well as Friends of Minnesota Scientific and Natural Areas. There's also, we have available uh, uh, a map, which is in color. Uh, if you want a map in color, those are available for you. I realize the map in black and white is perhaps harder to read. To describe the need for a lowland carbon and habitat reserve and its multiple benefits for climate action, biodiversity, hunting and gathering space, as well as long-term education funding, this is Robert Keene. Mr. Keene, Sierra Club North Star Chapter. State your name for the record. Welcome. Robert Keene. And as you mentioned, I'm a volunteer with the Sierra Club North Star Chapter. Chairman Hansen, Representative Purcell, and committee members, forests have traditionally been valued based on what can be extracted from them, lumber from above ground, peat or minerals from below ground. However, there has been a growing appreciation of other value derived from the forests, often referred to as ecosystem services. Forests clean the air, filter water supplies, control floods and erosion, sustain biodiversity, and provide opportunities for recreation and education. 
Most importantly, in addressing our current climate crisis, they sequester and store vast quantities of carbon and they basically do it for free. This legislation is focused on lowland conifer forest. These forest lands are seasonally or permanently wet. Some contain or are adjacent to peat bogs. The dominant tree species are white cedar, black spruce, and tamarack. There are several reasons for targeting this type of forest. Uh, they are abundant in Minnesota, representing 50% of state administered forest land, approximately 1.7 million acres, and 60% of these are in school trust, uh, school trust lands. They're in relatively pristine conditions. Condition, many stands have never been harvested and some may qualify for old growth cl classification. And protection to date has not been by design but due to limited commercial interest. The high cost and difficulty of harvesting in these areas, but areas uh, has not been justified by the, the quality and quantity of timber available. This bill would provide intentional protection to state administered lowland conifer forests, which do this now before they become endangered by rising temperatures, drying, and wildfires. Uh, the benefits, uh, I'll repeat some of those that have already been mentioned. Uh, carbon sequestration and storage from both forest and soil biomass and the peatlands. Habitat protection for native flora and fauna. Ongoing use by Minnesota tribes for hunting and gathering of traditional foods and medicine plants, thus honoring treaty rights and supporting education via payments to the permanent school fund to release school trust land obligations. Our unique lowland conifer forests are a centuries old intact ecosystem with a biodiverse collection of native plants and animals. It is one of a rare handful of such systems across the globe and is deserving of preservation on habitat protection alone. When you consider also its value in fighting climate change, this bill is an unrivaled twofer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Patty Thielen, Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Welcome. State your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Patty Thielen. I'm the DNR Forestry uh, Division Director. Um, the 2021 legislature directed the Department of Natural Resources to create a forest carbon report. Uh, we submitted this report called Forests and Carbon in Minnesota in January. It provides an understanding of our forests role in climate change mitigation and it identifies goals and strategies to sequester and store more carbon. Our forest carbon report highlights three main pathways for increasing sequestration and storage of carbon in our forests. Uh, first, retaining the forest cover that we already have, keeping our forested areas forested. Uh, threats to losing forest range from development to unaddressed forest health issues. Uh, the second pathway is increasing our forest cover uh, by encouraging tree planting on open lands that were once forested we can increase the amount of carbon being sequestered and stored in the future uh, the third pathway is managing our existing forests such that they sequester and store more carbon uh, than they would on their own this the proposal in this bill promotes carbon storage in older lowland conifer forests and mature forests do uh, store carbon, uh, but as they age, eventually trees die and the carbon uh, begins to be released from the forest. Uh, older forests sequester or absorb carbon at lower rates than younger forests, and by restricting opportunities to regenerate younger forests, uh, this bill could potentially have the adverse effect of reducing the long-term rate of carbon sequestration in lowland forests. Uh, this bill doesn't give us, doesn't allow us to give the forests a helping hand with regeneration. It wouldn't allow us to plant tree seedlings or to sow seeds uh, to ensure that the next generation of forest is well stocked and healthy. Um, we've had great success in regenerating our lowland conifer forests using an aerial seeding process with a helicopter, uh, and uh, this bill would not allow that. Uh, this bill eliminates management options used for forest health on lowland conifer forest. It, it, re, it uh, only allows timber harvest on uh, stands younger than 90 years old. 
uh, the eastern larch beetle and dwarf mistletoe are forest pests that affect uh, tamarack and black spruce in our lowland conifer forests. And the only way to halt these threats and stop their progression is to remove the affected areas, often in stands older than 90 years old, uh, usually through timber harvest. And this stops the spread of the pests and opens the site up to increase the amount of sun for regenerating seedlings. Uh, the bill also requires regular reporting of net carbon sequestration in lowland forests and soils across thousands of forest stands and accurately estimating net carbon sequestration at these very small spatial scales would be a significant technical challenge that would require new technologies and new measuring methodologies. In summary, active forest management, including some timber harvest uh, to prepare for the next generation of forest, but also forest health treatments and planting seedlings where needed are the best tools at our disposal for achieving the balance uh, that's needed to optimize our forest's ability to sequester and uh, store carbon and to help mitigate climate change in a way that generates a portfolio of social, economic, and environmental benefits. Aaron Vandalindi, Office of School Trust Lands. Vandalindi, we know we're back in session when we've got the School Trust Lands Director uh, coming to testify. I appreciate that, Mr. Chair. Aaron Vandalin, School Trust Lands Director. Uh, in the interest of time, I will limit my comments to uh, lines 4.17 to 4.24. I'm going to start, Mr. Chair, by rolling a grenade, and I apologize in the beginning, but uh, the school trust is still waiting for the legislature to appropriate $85 million to compensate the trust for the past policy designations. That law was passed in 2012. Still waiting on that money. That does include 52,000 acres of peatland scientific and natural areas that would likely fall under this law. With that said, uh, I have appreciated the... Uh, conversations I've had with the bill author about some um, possible amendments to this. I, um, I believe you've, we've heard the word fiduciary already and brought up how it's long-term education funding. Uh, I, I'd submit to you that the way this is written runs afoul of current law. There's a current law that right now says that you cannot sell more than 100,000 acres of school trust lands a year. Uh, there's roughly a million acres of these, so we're talking about a 10-year project process. Uh, there's also a law on the books that says uh, if school trust lands are going to be sold, they have to be appraised. That's 92.115. So um, establishing an arbitrary $500 limit while it might be in the ballpark, I don't think is um, above board. I want to see things done above board. Um, and, and I admitted to Representative Purcell the other day when we were talking that I might be negotiating against the school trust by requiring appraisals. But I still want things done properly. Um, the other, the, the last comment I want to make, Mr. Chair, is the legislature has given uh, our office authority to do an asset management plan. We actually had that law updated two years ago to require in that asset management plan that we advance strategies that take advantage of the ecosystem service markets. We've worked through that asset management plan. We have a priority recommendation in that plan that says that we need to adapt our school trust land portfolio to climate change and not only address the opportunities for markets, but also address the risks from climate change. Um, put taking all this land off the table and just letting the state buy it, I think takes away one of our opportunities. And one of those opportunities is to work with private industry to do the restoration work, to sell credits, to then fund education. So it wouldn't be a state appropriation, we'd be using private industry to do the restoration work to permanently protect these lands. The school kids then get a payment. With that, Mr. Chair, I'll end. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that'd like to testify for or against the bill? Welcome and state your name for the record. Thank you, Chair Hansen and members of the committee. My name is Rick Horton. I'm the Executive Vice President of Minnesota Forest Industries. We're a trade organization representing the large uh, primary wood consuming mills in the state of Minnesota. 
and we have a commitment to sustainable management. Um, our sector does, we're the fifth largest manufacturing sector in the state. We provide about 69,000 jobs in Minnesota, many of them in rural Minnesota. So obviously this has uh, implications for us. Um, I'd like to thank the Sierra Club and, and Representative Purcell for their interest in management of forests for carbon. I feel that we have a strong role to play in addressing climate change and that our forests can be managed better in part as, uh, as Director Thielen said, um, through active management because that does increase the rate at which we can uh, absorb carbon from the atmosphere, store it in products, and um, store it also on the, in the soils. So in these peatland complexes, we can sustainably manage the above ground biomass without harming the biggest pool, which is the pool of carbon under the soil and in the peats. So working lands are more likely to remain forested. Working lands are a part of the solution. That's an important part of it. Um, black spruce is an important timber type for the industry. It's got a unique fiber structure that is used in creating uh, mechanical uh, free sheet paper, the type of paper that you see in magazines and magazine covers, that glossy paper. Um, super important to one of the major paper mills here in the state. At a larger diameter, it can also be used for dimensional lumber, which is important for housing, and we talk about housing quite a bit down here. Um, but this 90-year upper limit for harvest is really not based in science. You can't just arbitrarily draw a line and say, from here on out, you can't harvest. Um, you know, stands become mature at the culmination of man, mean annual increment. That means they've stopped growing and have started the process of decline. At some point in that decline, they become net carbon emitters because the amount of death and decay outweighs the amount of absorption and growth. And professional foresters make that determination of when that time is. And that uh, age that that happens uh, varies by many factors, including the species, the genetics, the soil type, climatic conditions, hydrologic conditions. And that's why we have an art and science of forest management. They make those decisions of when it's best time to do the active management. And uh, as Director Thielen said, um, we have problems with insects and disease. These things don't live forever. Uh, when dwarf mistletoe hits a black spruce stand, you have to remove every single tree in the stand, including the little bitty ones, because that mistletoe is a living parasite that transfers from plant to plant. Remove them all, reseed it, and start back over. If you don't do that, that thing's gonna just decimate the rest of the stands, and that's what's happened in our tamarack. Tamarack has, uh, you know, we don't use as much tamarack, but we do use some tamarack. Eastern larch beetle has killed, going on a million acres of tamarack in northern Minnesota. And that's because we haven't been able to get out there and address it. We haven't been able to, we don't have the markets for it. It's also difficult because it's wet soil conditions. And, you know, with climate change, we have less opportunity to actually manage these, these wet soils. So we have all sorts of problems. But I would just say, um, you know, working forests are a large part of the climate solution. We're, you know, just a few years into figuring out how best to do this. And I encourage you to, you know, give that consideration, and we ask that you just, uh, you know, work. I, I do have a meeting scheduled with you for early next week, so let's sit down and talk about this. Thank you. All right, thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who'd like to testify for or against the bill? <clears throat> Members, uh, questions, and uh, just a reminder, this bill is being laid over, and before we go to questions, Representative Purcell, you're willing to work with, uh, you know, the testimony that's been heard and any member on the committee who uh, has concerns, is that correct? Mr. Chair, I have and I will continue to. Uh, Representative Finke. Thank you, Chair Hansen and Representative Purcell. I'm just interested in your take on something that was just said in the, in the final testimony. Um, I mean, there was a lot of good information there, um, but there were two pieces of information that I thought were really um, illuminating. One is that Black spruce is an important part of the market. So there are many reasons we need to be extracting trees for management, but it's an important part of the market. 
And then at the end, there was another tree that we weren't managing because there's not a market for it. And I, I apologize, I can't remember which one it was. It was the one the beetle was killing. The beetle kill. Tamarack. The, the beetle kill one. Yeah. The tamarack. And we're not doing that because that's not an important part of the market. Hmm. So do you feel like maybe the market shifting could really just make the arguments that we're hearing for management shift? Right? When, when we say there's no market for one tree and that's why the beetle's killing it, well, that doesn't really tell me that the tree that we're protect we're trying to protect because the market does have use is going to be a long-term management strategy. Does that make sense? Uh, um, yes, and I, I think uh, that's a great point. I hadn't thought about it quite in that way. Um, there's all sorts of ways that we value uh, trees in this example. Um, black spruce are a really important tree for basket making for our Ojibwa neighbors. Um, so there's all sorts of different ways. And, and I think one of the testifiers talked about the um, ecosystem service markets, which are kind of a new thing. We've been looking at that in agriculture for sequestering carbon. So um, I think there are all kinds of existing and emerging markets. And beyond capitalism, there's also some value, too. Thank you. Representative Heisman. Thank you, Chair. And as one of those folks that has many hats in this room, I'm uh, also, uh, a, in the past, a permit holder in a cedar blowdown on the north side of Lake Inguinata and firsthand observed what it looks like to have many, many thousands of trees that are about to go to uh, waste. They're going to rot and do as what we heard in testimony earlier today. Uh, become actually carbon emitters and was a part of the solution. And I don't know if this, this bill addresses that. And to Representative Finke's question, uh, if there isn't a market, if the trees are standing there and they are protected, in either scenario, they rot and become carbon emitters because they don't live forever. They just don't. And, and so that's part of what we're trying to raise in terms of concerns. But one thing that wasn't discussed, I just wanted to get some uh, feedback on Representative Parcell. If this bill became law, um, would any potential mining operation be affected? Representative Purcell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Not to my knowledge, that's not my interpretation of the language as it stands. Representative Heisman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to further elaborate, Representative Purcell, so let's say, for example, a mineral was discovered underneath one of these protected areas. Mm -hmm. Would this bill, could it be interpreted to uh, prohibit the access, potentially, if the trees on top of that potential uh, operation where mineral was found, uh, could that then prohibit that from moving forward? Representative Purcell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. I suppose perhaps that could, um, because I think w what we're looking at really is these like peatlands and it's the soil, it's that ground piece that we're most interested in not disturbing. So perhaps that would then. Thank you for bringing that up, but it had not occurred to me. Thank you, Chair. Representative Purcell, any closing comments? Um, I just want to thank all the testifiers and uh, appreciate the feedback and continue, I, I will uh, continue to work on this to make it better. Representative Purcell renews her motion that House File 2353 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. The bill is laid over. Next up, House File 897, Representative Brand, County Feedlot Program funding provided. Representative Brand, would you like to move that House File 897 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill? Yes, Mr. Chair, that's my motion. Representative Brand, to the bill. All right. House File 897 uh, is a, um, a request for $3 million per biennium, or per year, $6 million per biennium. Um, I have with me an actual feedlot uh, inspection officer for Blue Earth County to answer any questions, and maybe he can go over a little bit more about his j job duties and responsibilities. All I would really say is that for a lot of years in the Minnesota legislature, um, going back to its inception back in 1995, um, it's just that the funding has never kept pace with the actual job. And what we're trying to do here is catch up. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to my testifier. Rolfing, Blue Earth County uh, Property Environment. And 
Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Garrett Rolfing, and I'm a county feedlot officer for Blue Earth County and the past president and legislative committee chair of the Minnesota Association of County Feedlot Officers, or MACFO, which is an affiliate of the Association of Minnesota Counties. I'm here today to ask for your support of House File 897, which would increase the base appropriation for the county feedlot program. The county feedlot program is a partnership between the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and delegated counties to implement feedlot rules and regulations. During a difficult budget year in 2011, the base appropriation to the county feedlot program was decreased through funding cuts and unallotment. The costs at the county level have continued to increase and work plans increasingly include more accountability and documentation requirements. Additional funding would allow counties to provide a greater amount of contact and coordination with producers, local experts, and the public, which has benefits for the environment and everyone involved. Um, you should have a handout with you for more information about the program benefits and funding requests. I ask you to support this bill because it would help delegated county feedlot programs continue to protect water quality across the state. With that, um, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members for the opportunity to testify today and for Representative Brand for authoring the bill. I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Tom Johnson, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Tom Johnson, Government Relations Director for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, just wanted to, I'll keep it very brief, just wanted to support the bill. Uh, the MPCA uh, also has put forward this same amount of money in the governor's budget. We recognize that as costs for the MPCA is, have increased, also uh, they've increased for our county partners. So we're very supportive of this effort and thank you to Representative Brand for bringing it forward. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who'd like to testify for or against the feedlot bill? Anyone else? Any questions? Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Representative Brand, just one quick question. How does this uh, appropriation compare to the last biennium's uh, appropriation? Is it higher, lower? I'm trying to remember. You might not remember off the top of your head. If you don't, I. Yeah, so according to the, the, the uh, one brand that we have here, the highest it's ever been is 2.3 million. That was in 2003 when it peaked. Uh, since then, it's been about under what 1.9 million dollars for biennium. And so there's a shortfall, especially if we consider the, the you know it's just we live in Greater Minnesota. The thing is a drive, right? And so when people have to hop into a car, there's added costs to it over time. Everything's been 1.9 million dollars since uh, 2012. And so you know for the last 11 years, it's just been static. It's time to consider. Uh, in improvements in the funding, and that's the request. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. That's that's good. Appreciate the uh, history on this. Yep. Representative Brand, any closing comments? It's a good bill. Vote well, yes. Representative Brand renews his motion that House File 897 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. The bill is laid over. Representative Jordan, House File 2096, PFAS be prohibited in ski wax. Representative Jordan, would you like to move your bill? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. I move the House File 2096 be re referred to the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, okay. Representative Jordan, I believe you had an A1 author's amendment. Would you like to move your amendment and explain it briefly? Yes, Mr. Chair. I move the A1 author's amendment. This amendment puts um, the uh, definition of PFAS more in line with other bills that are moving through the process. Is there any discussion on the A1 amendment? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The motion prevails. The A1 amendment is adopted. Representative Jordan, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, we've heard extensive testimony on PFAS and its effects in this community. So you already know that PFAS adversely affects human health and can cause cancer, high cholesterol, liver damage, and much, much more. You know that PFAS does not break down in our environment and will remain present in our soil and water for so long that PFAS is known as a forever chemical. You also know that we in the legislature have the power to protect Minnesotans from exposure to PFAS. Uh, this bill bans it in ski wax and banning PFAS in ski wax is particularly important because PFAS in the ski wax directly contaminates Minnesota's soil and water. Ski wax is applied to the bottom of a ski or a snow Board. Thank you. 
Um, so no board, thank you. I was like, what's that thing for a board? Um, ski wax is um, applied to the bottom of the device used for snow recreation, which is a portion of the ski or board that touches the snow directly. This snow becomes contaminated with PFAS, then the snow melts and contaminates our soil and water. Uh, if you could not tell, I am not a skier or <laughs> snowboarder, <laughs> but I did bring one with me, um, and I would love to hear from Elsie Falconer um, and other testifiers at this time. I'd like to uh, start with Elsie Falconer, student and skier at Minnetonka High School. Welcome to the committee. If you could state your name. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Elsie Falconer, and I live in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. I am a freshman at Minnetonka High School, and I am on the Nordic ski team. Um, my family also skis a lot during the winter, including like skiing in the boundary waters and such. And I want PFAS to be banned in ski wax because it is harmful to both humans and animals, and it can cause types of cancer, reproductive issues, birth defects, and more. Uh, this chemical does not naturally break down, and while skiing, if you have wax on your skis with um, PFAS in it, that wax will like rub off your skis onto the snow. And when that snow melts, uh, the chemical will get into the water and the ground. Um, I, I'm in ninth grade, in my first year of Minnetonka High School, and I know that me and other skiers do not want our favorite activity contributing to poisoning the water. It is our generation that, will, that would have to deal with deal with this and like the cleanup of that and I ask you to ban be fast from ski wax to keep our water free and clean of this chemical thank you thank you Havana Stark clean water action Chair Hansen and members, I'm Ivana Stark, State Director of Clean Water Action. Clean Water Action works to ensure that Minnesotans have access to fishable, swimmable, and drinkable water. PFAS is a direct threat to our water and human health. We have heard that over the last few weeks. I'm here today to reiterate that bills such as House File 2096 play an important role in turning off the tap and stopping the flow of PFAS into the water. We have to be proactive and critically examine where it makes sense to remove PFAS from the supply chain to keep it out of landfills and our environment. There is simply no good reason to have PFAS in ski wax. PFAS in ski wax isn't essential and this is a common sense step to take to stop the flow of more toxic chemicals into our water, which will eventually have to spend which we will eventually have to spend taxpayer dollars to clean up. And it's a cycle that we can't keep repeating over and over. The regional park system in Hennepin County doesn't use ski wax on their skis, so we know that we can do without it. If we want to continue to profit off of our tourism industry that allows people to eat fish from our lakes, streams, and rivers, and the game that we hunt, or even the crops that we grow without fear of illness from PFAS, we have to take action now. It's time to join the other states, countries, brands, and businesses that are saying enough is enough to this toxic man-made chemical. It's time to choose people over profits, and I urge a yes vote. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify for or against the bill? Anyone else? Uh, so I have uh, Representative Brand and then Representative Schultz. Representative Brand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, you know, one of the most prevalent ski wax um, in the world that um, has PFAS is called 8-2-FTOH. Has anybody ever heard of that before? Uh, it's also known as 1, 1, 2, 2 dash tetrahydro uh, floral can and all. Probably don't know what that is either. But what I will tell you is that when you look at the MSDS, the guiding documents for how to handle this stuff, under environment, environmental precautions, it says prevent surface and groundwater infiltration as well as ground penetration. How huh, the heck do you do that in a state like Minnesota <laughs> where we have ski hills that point downward? with snow that melts downward. That's all I had for that. Representative Jordan. Mr. Chair, uh, yes, snow melts. The melt water and the runoff goes into our, our soil and water. That's a problem. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Jordan. Is there any federal legislation or rulemaking that you're aware of that uh, can address this issue and uh, so that we're not working uh, through a frame where this is happening in other places? 
Representative Jordan. Mr. Chair, Representative Schultz, I'm a state legislator. Um, I'm focused on what the state can do, and the state can do this. So, Representative Schultz. Yeah, are you aware of any legislation on the federal level? Representative Jordan. Mr. Chair, no. Representative Schultz, I believe there's some work being done at the federal level overall on PFAS. Um, I'm not aware of anything on specific on the ski wax issue. But we do have DCA here. <laughs> I, did, I didn't say they had an answer. I just said they were here. No, I don't got none either. Mr. Chair, again, Tom Johnson, MPCA. Uh, I'm not aware of any federal legislation on this either. So, Representative Scraba. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Elsie, um, I don't know if you're aware, but the state champion of the Nordic ski this year is from Ely, Minnesota, Zoe De Devine, and she skis in the Boundary Waters too. So keep up the good work. Thank you. Representative Purcell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, have a question, I guess, for perhaps our testifier or perhaps the bill author. Um, do you know of any efforts um, in Minnesota that address PFAS or other chemicals like this in ski wax? Ms. Falconer. Um, uh, yeah, um, the Minnetonka State High School League for Nordic Skiing, the U.S. Ski and Snowboard, um, the Theater Worth um, Park and the American Birkebeiner, which is in Wisconsin, but a lot of Minnesotas go th Minnesotans go there. And there are many more places that have already banned PFAS. Great, um, that's really good to know. I'm curious, was that a student initiated um, or where is the leadership for that sort of action coming from? Ms. Falconer. Uh, I'm not sure. Representative Purcell. Representative Jordan, to close. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I should have obviously had Ms. Falconer answer that question about what other uh, entities are doing to ban PFAS. Um, and we can't wait for her to join us someday um, sitting at this table. But PFAS is bad. Um, we should prevent it from getting into our environment and bodies. I ask members' support. Representative Jordan renews her motion in House File 2096 as amended be re referred to the Ways and Means Committee. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. The motion prevails. Congratulations. Uh, members, next, there's several bills by me. We have a little bit of extra time, so we're going to change up the order of those. Uh, and Representative Jordan is going to take the gavel. He's going to We're going to get going again, um, and we have a lot to get through in very little time. Uh, we are going to start with House File 1514, um, related to the Metropolitan Council. Representative Hansen, would you like to move this House File? Thank you, Madam Chair. I would move House File 1514 uh, be laid over for possible inclusion in omnibus bill. And Representative Hansen, um, I see there is an A1 author's amendment. Would you like to move the amendment and explain it for the committee? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. House File 15. 1514, we have discussed inflow infiltration in this committee before and in other committees. And if you might remember uh, when we had Met Council here a couple weeks ago, I asked them about average uh, water, wastewater costs. So the amendment, the A1 amendment, is actually telling them to get that information uh, to us so that we can use it. So I would move the A1 amendment to get the bill in the shape we would like. Representative Hansen moves the A1 amendment to get the form and the author would like. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. And the motion prevails. The A1 amendment is adopted. Representative Hansen, to your bill is amended. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, House File 1514, as amended, uh, inflow infiltration has been uh, an appropriation for like 20 years without a program, without these basic definitions. So it's been dependent on every legislature in the session to be adding uh, to those appropriations. So we felt it was important uh, to put uh, definitions in relating to the program for future legislatures rather than each legislature having to reinvent the wheel each time. So I ask for your support as we lay this over. And is there anyone in the audience that would like to testify on this bill? Questions from members? Okay, Representative Hansen, closing comments? Oh. I renew my motion to lay it over. Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 1514 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill and the bill is laid over. We are going to go in reverse order from your agendas, um, which in that case, next up uh, will be, um, plastic. we're going to do House File 2126 um, related to plastics. Uh, Representative Hansen, would you like to move the bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. I would move that House File 2126 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. And I believe there's also an A1 amendment with this House File as well. Would you like to move the amendment and explain it briefly, Mr. Chair? Thank you, Madam Chair. Member House File 2126 A1 amendment incorporates suggestions from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Uh, so I think they're good suggestions uh, relating again to definitions, and I'd ask for your support. Representative Hansen moves the A1 amendment to get the bill in the form he would like. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? And the motion prevails. The A1 amendment is adopted. Representative Hansen, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, several years ago, we attempted uh, uh, through the Clean Water Fund to have definitions of microplastics. And you've all probably read about microplastics or seen stories on the news, but again, definitions matter. And so this is to provide definitions. Uh, the bill uh, uh, had definitions uh, that we, uh, the Pollution Control Agency thought they could improve upon. Uh, I have uh, both the Pollution Control Agency uh, and I believe the Chamber of Commerce are here to testify. First on my list to testify is Tom Johnson from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Uh, Welcome back. Uh, please say your name um, and then proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, again, Tom Johnson, Government Relations Director for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Uh, I'll keep it really brief. Again, I uh, really want to thank Chair Hansen for, for working with us on the definitions. These uh, represent the input from our scientists and technical staff, and so uh, we really appreciate that inclusion. Uh, microplastics, like other unregulated contaminants, still require a great deal of work to understand. Um, in, in 2019, the legislature appropriated some funds to the, to the Department of Health for unregulated contaminants, a portion of which has come to the MPCA to specifically start some work on, on microplastics and nanoplastics, but there's still a lot to be learned in this area, and we appreciate that. Uh, this appropriation provides the flexibility for our staff to, to follow the science, do what's needed to develop protocols, um, transfer money to other agencies as needed uh, to, to begin that implementation. Um, you know, so this is a great start to the work, and, and again, I want to thank the chair for, for working with us on this one. So thank you. Happy to stand for questions. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Next on my list is Mr. Tony Quillis from the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Quillis. Please state your name. Proceed with your testimony. Afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Tony Quillis. I'm the Director of Environmental Policy at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. I want to thank you for the opportunity to make some comments on House File 2126. Ms. Madam Chair and members, you've heard me a couple times before this committee talk about consistency and clarity and definitions of legislation as we move forward. And that's why uh, I'd also like to mention that right uh, at the start here Madam Chair, um, to make sure that the definitions of micro, nano, and plastic uh, are the match up with other state and federal regulations so that we don't cause confusion. And in my little research that I've been doing along these lines, Madam Chair, I am unfortunately finding some differences between um, what's being used in California and for the EPA 
And I think some of it has to do also whether we're, us we're using nanometers or micrometers. So I'd like to keep working with Representative Hansen and the agency as we go through to try and tighten up those definitions so that we're all on the same page, Madam Chair. And then also um, in regards to the uh, protocols, just want to utilize all of the definitions and protocols that other states are also using so that we can all be on the same page. Mr. Johnson mentioned that the Department of Health got about 400, 400, I think it was about $800,000 from Clean Water Legacy in 2019 and formed an interagency work group to address microplastics and do some research along those lines. University of Minnesota Duluth and the uh, USGS are also uh, doing some work and research on microplastics. And I think maybe we should let those entities do their research and finish that before we, and compare with other states uh, as well as the feds, before we start developing protocols and try and go through and make sure that um, those are all, again, um, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Chair, paired up. So. Along those lines, again, just consistency and clarity in the uh, definitions, and then also before we start uh, establishing the protocols, just to make sure that all stakeholders are involved there to make everything um, consistent, Madam Chair. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to testify for or against this bill? Um, great. We'll go to questions from members. Um, first on my list is Representative Gilman. Thank you, Madam Chair. So quick question for MPCA or you. Um, in regards to how long would it take to develop the protocols um, and like what, what do you see? Like how would the measure be on how long it would take to develop those protocols and then how would we know um, your findings on it? Mr. Johnson, please reintroduce yourself and then proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Tom Johnson, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, the appropriation lasts uh, through 2025, so certainly we would do everything we can to meet that deadline. Um, so I, I, we, again, have some basis from some previous appropriations uh, that have come to the, the Pollution Control Agency, and we would begin certainly, um, you know, working on this immediately and, and try to meet that deadline of 2025. Representative Gilman. Thank you. Um, questions from members? Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Representative Hanson, I'm curious if uh, there's any uh, specific issue we're working towards addressing with this legislation. So in other words, is this uh, a bill that's getting at what you would consider to be previous sources of these microplastics, or are you aware of any say, for example, legislation or otherwise that's creating an emerging issue in this category? Chair Hansen. Madam Chair and Representative Heinzman, uh, you know, I think since the 2019, there's been a lot of publication about we're finding microplastics in people's blood. Um, we're finding it in us. We're finding microplastics on people going on the top of Mount Everest are finding microplastics. We're finding microplastics uh, with deep sea exploration. So microplastics, you know, as a physical contaminant, there's been more and more publication. I think definitions matter. I appreciate that the Pollution Control Agency uh, revised uh, our original definition here. Uh, so my purpose here is that we have a standard in terms of definitions and that we develop protocols for the future because an accurate assessment, whether it's affecting human health, wildlife, water quality, air quality, all of those issues, it's, um, it's actually kind of frightening that they're finding it everywhere. And so developing those protocols, I think, we often have talked about the chemistry. We've talked about PFAS here, but here's a physical contaminant uh, that apparently is everywhere. And in order to have, so when we're talking about it, we have the same definitions for future legislatures uh, that are there. Definitions make a difference and having protocols that are directed by the legislature make a difference so we're not dealing on the whims of individual legislatures. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Um, Representative, Representative Hanson, you and I have been to all of the same hearings, I think, for the most part. We serve on a lot of the same subcommittees. 
And so I'm, I'm familiar with those things. What I'm getting at specifically is, is there anything that's, you know, an emerging issue of some sort that this is working towards addressing? Is there something that has changed? Is there anything that you see on the horizon that this committee should be aware of that this could potentially address? Uh, you know, in other words, why are we working towards passing this kind of legislation? I, I think maybe setting a definition for the future, for a future legislator, legislature might actually create some problems, because what if the problem changes between now and then? So, Madam Chair, Hansen. I think the issue is scale. Scale. That this, these plastics appear to be everywhere. So as we've invested in small amounts of research, we're seeing pieces of this. But having protocols that would be a public <coughs> process that the agency would go through is prudent because the scale of what we might be seeing here, we may be only using the analogy tip of the iceberg as we're getting different pieces of this. So this is a big issue. What we're talking about today here with plastics might be what 10 years from now, the people who sit in these chairs are talking, that we're talking about with PFAS now. I think if we had tried to address that 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago, mm -hmm. and as the information starts coming on microplastics, plastics in us, we need to start looking at that, and this provides a framework for that. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Representative Hanson, I'm, I, I don't necessarily disagree that scale is relevant. I guess for, for the benefit of all of us here today and those that might be watching at home, how would a changing this definition help us address what you consider like in, in testimony today to be the issue, scale? We already know that microplastics are in places essentially wherever we look. Are we, are we looking in places and not finding microplastics where this bill would capture that and be able to help us identify microplastics that are previously undiscovered? Chair Hansen. Madam Chair and Representative Heinzman, what this bill would do is it provides that basis, the framework, so that we can start to address those issues. Without that, we're, we're going back to a 2019 appropriation of session law. That's the only documentation, the only description, other than what's been done in LCCMR for specific research projects. So having protocols to deal with it is important. I don't know how many times I can say that. That's, that's the foundation. There is no ulterior motive that is going on here. We have an issue of microplastics. Mr. Johnson. And Madam Chair, thank you. And just, just to expound on that, this, this, d these definitional changes do allow there to be something measurable in statute. You know, there, there are a lot of uh, measurements that are happening in different uh, types of publications or studies currently, so having a consistent definition is, is helpful. One last question, Representative Heinzman, then we're gonna move on. No further questions, Madam Chair. Th that is actually very helpful. Thank you. Well, great. Um, Representative Hansen, closing comments? I, I just can't let it pass without noting that Mr. Quillis was advocating a California standard for this. Um, so we'll just note that for the future, I think. Uh, but I appreciate the comments uh, uh, and the suggestions from the PCA and look forward, this is being laid over, so I'd renew my motion that House File 2126 be laid over. Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 2126 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill, and the bill is laid over. We have been given permission to go until 5.45, um, and, we, and we will do that. But in the meantime, we will go to House File 2171. Um, members, we're going to keep going. Um, Representative Hansen, would you like to move your bill? I would move House File 2171 uh, be laid over for possible inclusion in omnibus bill. And Representative Hansen, I believe you have the DE1 author's amendment. Would you like to move your amendment and explain it for the committee? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the DE1 amendment uh, is uh, based on input from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency relating to odor management. So uh, 
I'm taking their suggestions uh, and incorporating them in the DE1 amendment. And I would move the DE1 amendment. Uh, Representative Hansen moves the DE1 amendment to get the bill in the form the author would like. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, say no. And the motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. And Representative Hansen, to your bill as amended. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. Uh, for the House File 2171 uh, as amended, you know, a generation ago, Minnesota actually did have odor management uh, uh, law. Uh, those were repealed in the 90s. Uh, but the issue is still here. And uh, what I'm trying to do here is provide some type of statewide response uh, on odor management. There are several exemptions in the bill uh, that are there that are not included. Uh, mm -hmm. I will be very clear. I have an odor issue in my district. Uh, if you've ever driven across the Wakota Bridge, uh, I have constituents in Newport and St. Paul Park that uh, have, frankly, an unbearable odor uh, much of the time. And so that's the purpose on the bill, is to try to have some statewide response with the Pollution Control Agency, uh, and it provides some money there for rulemaking. The basis for the law came from North Carolina and their existing law on odor management. Um, and so that is the purpose, um, and I think it would provide protection uh, for my constituents and other constituents, and I believe there are testifiers. There's one person who signed up to testify, and that is Mr. Quillis from the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Mr. Quillis, come on down. Please reintroduce yourself um, and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Tony Quillis, Director of Environmental Policy at the Mis Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. And I think there is one more individual behind me from Packaging Corporation of uh, America. <laughs> they can come on down when we do public testimony. But go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Representative Schultz. Madam Chair, members, the uh, difficulty when we start talking about uh, regulating odors is that they tend to not be uh, concentration-based, and each individual's sensitivity is different. In regards to the bill, um, Madam Chair and members, we start to try and go through and define what an objectable odor is. And if you look at the definitions on starting on 1.9 and 1.10, Reasonable, reasonably be expected to be injurious and unreasonably interferes with the enjoyment of life. So the concern there are those are broad, pretty broad and open to interpretation um, for the definition of objectionable odor. Also, if you just drop down to 1.12 to 1.13, it talks about an odor complaint that would start to trigger the odor management plan that's required later on in the bill. All it would take would be one phone call or one email to any the commissioner of the Pollution Control Agency or a political subdivision that would start the commissioner um, to show up and looking at it to determine whether a facility is emitting any objectionable odor. So, Madam Chair, there are some concerns there, and then also how the Pollution Control Agency would identify whether a facility is um, emitting an objectionable odor. Um, whether that would be stack tests or how they would go about doing that. And Madam Chair, finally, kind of last point I'd like to point out, under 11607, which is the powers and duties of the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, subdivision nine, actually talks about or orders and investigations, specifically around air contamination. It allows the agency um, to make tests, including testing for odor where a nuisance may exist. So I think that the Pollution Control Agency has this authority already. So Madam Chair, between the uh, concern over the uh, definitions being um, kind of broad and then already thinking that the agency has these authorities, I'd like to keep working with um, Representative Hansen with the situation he has in his district, but right now this affects all facilities throughout the state of Minnesota. Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity to testify on House File 2171. 
Thank you. Um, it sounds like there might be someone in the audience who would like to testify. Please come on down, um, state your name for the record, and proceed with your testimony. Madam Chair, members of the committee, author of the bill. Uh, my name is John Piotrowski. I serve as the Vice President of Environmental Operations for Packaging Corporation of America. We're headquartered in Lake Forest, Illinois. We have over 100 facilities across the United States scattered uh, over three dozen states. We own and operate the International Falls Paper Mill and we have uh, owned that facility for uh, 10 years. Uh, the, the facility is uh, the largest uh, manufacturing employer in Kuchichin County with 580 employees. Uh, the secondary employment impact of the facility is an additional 1,800 jobs in a county of 12,000 people. Um, the mill sits on the south bank of the Rainy River. It's situated in unquestionably a spectacular part of your state and we are sensitive to that and we make every intention and effort to be good neighbors and good stewards of the environment that we are privileged to uh, be hosted uh, in that community. Um, we have a concern with uh, H uh, HF uh, 2171 in particular. Um, pulp and paper mills, craft pulp and paper mills, which is what we operate in I Falls, uh, it does produce odor. However, uh, US EPA uh, 25 years ago implemented a series of national emission standards for the control of hazardous air pollutants, many of which are odiferous. Um, we have elaborate control systems, collection systems, incineration systems, uh, monitoring and reporting obligations uh, that already exist. And our concern uh, with the language in the bill is that um, it would compound and perhaps duplicate and be redundant with existing obligations that we already have. Um, what we would appeal for is an, addition, an additional exemption wherein facilities that are already subject to federal NESHAP and MAC, uh, maximum achievable control technology obligations, which we are and which we do comply with, that we'd be included as a line item exemption in that uh, rule. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you, members, for the opportunity to comment. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to testify on this bill? Um, with that, we will go to questions from members. And first on my list is Representative Schultz. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Hansen. Uh, this bill, uh, as you know well, and including in your D, uh, DE amendment here, it kind of lays out um, who it does not apply to. And I think that it, we don't see a lot of bills that come through the legislature that are written to that effect. And I guess my first question for you is why, why is this bill written that way? Chair Hansen. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Representative Schultz. Uh, many of those exemptions were similar to what was carried in the in other bill in the other states. So, you know, when we were first modeling, what we did add in, uh, in the particular in the DE one was restaurants, mm -hmm. and I'll use that as an example. Uh, I think the direct quote from the PCA was that some of the um, more senior PCA staff who had been around during that time with the previous order that restaurants were an issue, so they remembered that, mm -hmm. provided that input, and I put that in. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Hansen. I, I just have a lot of concern for it because, and I, I, I personally, I don't know the circumstance that you're dealing with in your district and the way that you're seeking to respond to the need in your community. I, I don't know that, but I'll, I'll just say that when we're building the legislation like like we are today in this bill, it, it leaves a lot of frankly, a lot of opportunity for mistakes. And and like in some of these ex exemptions, like I, frankly, I'm concerned with the way that some of them are written, you know, and, and you know, I could, I'm, I'm gonna give you one example right now. The first one, on farm, animal, and agriculture operations. Now, this legislative session has been just a, just kind of a, a just ramrodding through a whole bunch of legislation related to food processing facilities. I don't know in your exemption if that would 
include a food processing facility. And I just, I think that this isn't necessarily the right way for us to go about defining who is exempt. And I think that we should really caution ourselves about how we go about writing bills um, to this effect. Representative Hansen. Madam Chair and Representative Schultz, I appreciate uh, your concern on that. I, I would note that I think it was in Representative Purcell's, uh, one of her earlier bills today, there were requests for exemptions. So, you know, often there are requests for exemptions that come in bills. Um, to kind of bring it back to Mr. Quillis's point on uh, the clause that is in existing statute, I think what this does, again, with definitions, is it at least provides a better map than what there is now. That you have uh, rulemaking, which would then help define this, it provides for that. It has the exemptions, and then it also provides uh, for an order management plan. So again, when we don't have these things in statute, it's subject to nuisance. Mm -hmm. And nuisance definitions, anything could be in there. That th those exemptions may not be there. So I think this helps with your concern. And I am certainly, you know, this is being laid over. I'm certainly open. I talked with the forest products mm -hmm. industry. I understand their concern. You know, I think when they're referencing existing federal, that's another way of doing things. So uh, I'm open to continued discussions on this, but I just like with the previous bill, it's important to get definitions into law. Otherwise, that you have that subjectivity mm -hmm. that's there for the agency if complaints come. Representative Liz Lagarde. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and to uh, Chair Hansen, I know that you're always amenable to uh, having conversation. I know this is going to be laid over. Um, it is broad, uh, and it, it is uh, sweeping uh, across the state of Minnesota, and that, that concerns me. Um, uh, any one individual that could uh, trigger uh, this scares me. Um, we have people that um, don't agree with certain industries, and all they have to do is drive around and make a phone call, and next thing you know, we're, we're doing this. And, I, and that's how I understand it. I could be wrong. Um, but if you would be amendable to uh, have conversations about um, the impact uh, that it could have, the detrimental impact uh, potentially uh, on not wanting to do that, but it could. And I have real concerns. So if you'd be willing to have a conversation uh, you know, offline as this goes through the process, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Yep, I'm supportive of having that. Um, I think the Pollution Control Agency, if I could just call them up to, to give their- Chair Hanson, we have, yes. Actually, we do have time for the Pollution Control Agency. Uh, Mr. Johnson, briefly, to Representative Liz Lagarde's query. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. And again, Tom Johnson, uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. I would just uh, call out that the, the rule section, we do call out that, there, uh, that we would determine a process for investigating and, and addressing odor complaints. So, you know, not necessarily one complaint. I think the underlying bill had six complaints. Um, we wanted to have that moved into rulemaking so there'd be a public and open process where people could comment to the PCA and say, this is not the right amount of comment, or, uh, you know, uh, complaints or, so we would build out that process and rule. But anyway, happy to continue to work with Representative Hansen and, and you, Representative Lizagard, on the final shape of the bill. Great. Representative Scraba. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, um, um, Chair Hansen. Uh, I, as the representative of the uh, PCA, the other PCA, <laughs> in, in International Falls and mines in Silver Bay and donut shops in Grand Marais, you know, every, everything has an odor and how we go to this. Uh, I, I, I do have, I, I think the gentleman from PCA had, had a good in, indication. It's been regulated somewhere already. Um, and, and if you're really just after definitions, I think that that is amendable, commendable. I think that's something we need to look at. But uh, at the same time, if we're going to have some time to chat with this before it start, shows up again, I think it would be good. Thank you. Representative Jacob. Thank you, Chair Hanson. So in my district, at my hometown actually, very large packing plant a vegetable packing plant. And I'm wondering, can you explain to me how this would, if they're agriculturally 
based products. You know, they're bringing um, contracts from agriculture into their packing plant. How would it apply to that packing plant? What's objectionable? I mean, uh, heavy odors of sweet corn in my town. <laughs> uh, some people like it, some people don't. What's objectionable? How would it apply? For Representative Hansen. Madam Chair, and I think what Mr. Johnson was just saying, we're trying to, with the rulemaking and the authority here, is have some system of defining that. We need further exemptions. I am open to that. Uh, but right now, you have a clause on nuisance law that opens everything up right now. And what I'm trying to do here is to provide that. Uh, I am hesitant, because I'll just be blunt, the situation in my district is with a rendering plant in a metropolitan area that affects thousands of people. And um, so the, I think having rulemaking to go through this is really important because it provides for not having the mistakes as Representative Lizzie Yard made. If we can put the guardrails on that, you know, I, I'm clearly open to those discussions. But again, right now, we're dealing with nuisance law, which could come up. One more. Representative Jacob, then we're going to go to Representative Finke. Okay. So uh, coming from a county board position, counties and cities and so forth, they like their local control and wouldn't say that like the issue you have here with the rendering plant, isn't there already local control that could manage this and would this be taking local control away? Representative Hansen. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Jacob, the cities have tried and have not succeeded. Representative Finke. Thank you, Chair, and I'll be here. Brief, I just would like to say thank you for bringing this bill. I know that there are many different ways we can understand this, but this is a problem in my district. I have a paper mill in my district and it stinks. And I heard about it on the trail. People complained about it to me. It covers all of the university. The university students are always asking. You can Google what, what, you know, people are always wondering what is that smell? It smells bad very often all the way down University Avenue. It's a real problem. It's not, I don't know whether the answer is in density or some other metric, but like this is a problem in the city. That's probably 10, 15,000 people who are, who are having this odor that they consider unpleasant. And it's not a donut shop, it's a real stinky, stinky odor. And there's no question about that. I think it's reasonable to ask, what can we do? Thanks. Representative Hansen, closing comments. Um, this is an issue. Uh, it's an important issue. I commit to working with folks on this because I'd like to get something passed here. It's an important piece. I would also invite you all to my district in the summer, maybe on an 80 or 90 degree day. Um, if you would like, I renew my motion that this be laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 2368, as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill, and the bill is laid over. Members, I don't recommend you take Representative Hansen up on that offer to visit on a 90-degree day. I did, and it does smell bad. <laughs> 21, excuse me, Representative Hansen renews his mo motion that House File 2171, as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill, and that bill is laid over. Um, members, uh, I'm... We're getting out 30 seconds early, and with that, we are adjourned for the day. <laughs>